it's clearly the case that when a uniting structure de- de- deteriorates, people say, freedom, freedom. It's like, no, that is not what happens. What happens is chaos, anxiety, terror, bitterness, disappointment, frustration, especially if it's imposed upon them. And, so, that, and that's why I think it's very important that just at the end of that chapter, there's a strange mention of ordinances, you'll keep the commandments mm-hmm. you know, before they've actually been given. There's this sense that freedom can't just be complete anarchy. This is a point that's come back again and again in, our sem- in the previous seminars, hasn't it? Mm. The absolute desert is freedom from structure. Right. Thank you for joining us as we journey through the great book of Exodus. And thank you very much to the DW Plus crew for having the vision and generosity of spirit to make this Exodus seminar produced at no small cost and substantial risk, freely available to all who are interested on YouTube. Perhaps you might consider a Daily Wire Plus subscription. It's a bastion of free speech. and We have great content there with much more to come. We journeyed to Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem to film a four-part documentary series on Western civilization and have additionally recorded specials on marriage, vision, the pitfalls and opportunities for adventure and masculinity, all of which are exclusively available there. These join many of the Beyond Order public lectures that made up my recent tour and my extensive back catalog, fully uncensored. Onward and upward. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode seven of the Exodus Seminar, where we just finished chapter 14 yesterday. We're going to try to get through 15 and 18 today. I'll introduce everybody as I have been, participants. On my right, Jonathan Pajo, Stephen Blackwood, Dennis Prager, Greg Hurwitz, James Orr, and Oz Guinness. We've We closed yesterday with the image of the Israelites beginning to be guided along their pathway as they move further out of Egypt by a pillar of fire during the night and a pillar of cloud during the day and commented on the analogy between that and the yin-yang notion of chaos and order and the notion that the proper place to be is between them and that the cloud The pillar of cloud during the day is darkness in the day, and the pillar of fire at night is light during the night. So that's another echo. We ended with 1424 to 31, which describes the actual crossing of the Red Sea and the decimation of the Egyptians. We need to comment on that, but we're going to go through the first part of chapter 15, which is a song devoted to that event and then we'll cover all that territory and move forward. And so I'll start with Exodus 15, 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him, place to live, a reference to the historic nature of that God, and the exaltation is to be placed in the highest place. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them, They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. I believe that often the right hand of God is associated with justice, and we can return to that. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods 
stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfi satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretched, thou stretched, <laughs> thou stretchedst out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary. It sounds like a pre prodroma to the ark idea. Which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord. That's quite a song. For he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And that essentially ends in triumph and celebration, the crossing of the Red Sea. And so we start with the pillar and fire. This is back to 1424. God's decimation of the Egyptian chariots then the utter catastrophic dissolution of the Egyptian army in the, in the chaotic waters. Yeah, so the, I think so there, one of the things that's very important is to understand the relationship, first of all, between the flood and this situation. So there's a repetition and pattern between the end of the old world and also the end of the civilization of Cain. It's, it's very important to understand before the flood, there was this kind of high civilization and metallurgy is like the last thing that is developed by Cain's descendants in order bringing them and war and all these things, bringing them up to the flood. And so we have this image where now as they're crossing, the civilization part, that's why the chariots are so important. It's like this, 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 this technological Logical aspect that the that the, right. the Pharaoh has is being destroyed by the waters of chaos. Like all the order, all this, these weapons, all this stuff that you have developed uh, is being is being crushed. Right, because Tubal Cain is the last of Cain's descendants, right? And by tradition, he's the first artificer of weapons, weapons. of war. Yeah, right. And that's part of the degeneration of the spirit of Cain into the technology that's used to wage war. And so you see that as an echo here. Definitely. There's definitely an echo here. And, mm. and the idea of a, of a broken civilization or a civilization that's gone too far and that has become uh, degenerate, basically. But technology is actually part of it. If you don't understand that, it's going to be hard to understand also the establishment of the idea of an altar of uncut stone where we have to recreate this pure space of like pure 
space. And, and, and so if you look at the image, all the images in the text of the song can help you understand what's going on. You have this image of God, the right hand, the wind, you know, the, the, the breath, all of these things are, are the actions of God, this glory, all of this raising up. Then you have the waters, the falling back onto the waters, the deep, the earth swallowed them, all these images uh, of, uh, and it says like, you know, the, the deep has pulled them down, all of these images. And then afterwards, we're now we're going to the mountain and the mountain you'll be planted like new seedlings. The mountain, the sanctuary, the mountain is now a temple of worship. All of these images are showing us like what is... And that's an alternative to the tyranny. That's right, well. exactly. It's like a return the to the garden is a good the, way to understand isn't it. Isn't the uncut stone, isn't the rest of the stone polished? Like that's, un, that's an unusual request to differentiate it. Is that right, historically? In the, not in the first altar that is, that is asked of them. It's a, it's an altar of uncut stone. Later, it's, it'll be different. No, meaning, the, but specifying that it's uncut stone here is a break from tradition. Is that right? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not okay. sure. I'm not yeah. sure. But for sure, it's, you'll see, it's, we haven't gotten there yet, but okay, so I'm we just have, trying to show you the pattern. We have a tyranny that doubled down and then degenerated into catastrophe. And then we have the beginning of the Exodus, and then we have the the Israelites up against the sea, and then we have the the final attempt by the Egyptians to use the technology of war against them, and then we have the complete destruction of that by chaos itself. So we have the degeneration of tyranny into complete chaos, and then the it's not, and it's not just the chaos. It's properly constructed yeah. as an antidote to that. And it's important to understand it's not just chaos. It's like it's really as the separation of heaven and earth. That's when the, that's when the world ceases to exist. So that's why there's an image of both the waters, but then also the the breath of God above and the mm. and, and and God acting so it's above. Just the clash of the of the primordial elements. Is it like is that is is that that's more than the chaos because it's the clash of the primordial elements. Part of the generative spirit well, like and the, the potential. I think it's really the separation, which is what brings about the. That's what brings about the flood. Is when when the ideas are too high, and the embodiment is too low, right? It doesn't it doesn't match. So it's like a good idea. It's like flying cars. Like flying cars is a great idea, but it, it'll never land. It'll never join with reality because it's a it's an idea that's too high, and the potential that is. Tr- wanting to hold it is not incapable of holding it. And so because of that, that world of, of flying cars will never, will no, won't exist. Or maybe one day it will, but at least for now it can't because it, it, won't, it won't join together. You need something above, like an idea, or you need a purpose, and you need a body that can hold that purpose. And when you don't have those together, then you don't have a world, mm-hmm. whatever world that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. There's so no you, proper covenant like the Tower of Babel. That's right, exactly. A it's a sort of symbol of human pride that reaches upwards, but it's never connected. It doesn't reach. I'd like to point out the last uh, verse in 14 right before this. is, uh, And uh, when Israel saw the wondrous power, this is my translation, I'm not mine, I'm the one I'm using, which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, they had faith in the Lord and, in, and his servant Moses. So I, I'm just repeating a point, but it's such an important point to help people who are grappling with faith that here they are, they just saw the most incredible miracle of all, transcending even the 10 plagues, mm. the crushing of Pharaoh's army. They are walking through a sea that uh, allows them dry land. Now they fear God and believe in God and believe in Moses. They have faith, or really have faith in both. For at least three days. Yes, this will last, right. You can count it in hours. That is just, again, it's such a, it's brilliant that it has that line. Hey, guess what? They just saw this and they have faith for a totally finite amount of time. Miracles don't work and people should not rely on them for faith. Well, that's the difference between faith and proof in some sense, right? That's a very, that's good. That's right. Yes. But even if you get proof, proof. it doesn't last. Mm -hmm. Miracles should be proofs. Mm -hmm. Right, right. No, that's that's also an indication of their inadequacy. Well, the thing, the thing about proof, even proof in some sense, if you think about it, technically proof can't work in relationship to the horizon of the future, because if it's true that the future differs qualitatively from the past, which seems to be the case, that it's literally not predictable then even if something did work in the past, that's the scandal of induction. Just because something did work in the past doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. And so that means that in some real sense, I think this is fundamentally true. In some real sense, you cannot confront the horizon of 
the potential of the future without faith. There, mm-hmm. That is what you use to confront that. Because mm-hmm. other, otherwise, it's mere repetition of the past, in which case it's not really the future at all. It's not potential. And so that must be associated, too, with that, the idea of the word that confronts potential at the beginning of the time. time that's truth serving love in some sense, but it's also got to be something like faith in the ability of potential to bring forth the order that is good, because you never confront it otherwise. And so... So science, the natural sciences need a kind, a degree of faith, a degree of credence when, the, when you're trying to sort of make, make predictions, or a scientist is trying to make predictions and apply hypotheses. You're right, there is... Well, well the faith would be that 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 which corrects your prediction, because maybe you'd like your prediction to be true, but even more fundamentally, you have to believe that the transcendent object that corrects your presuppositions is good, yeah, and, and that and that and, making contact with that serves the good, yeah, and governed by regularities and patterns and life-giving yeah. orders. Uh, well, other, otherwise, you'd think you'd you'd think more like Prometheus, right? You'd think, well, we don't want to make contact with the transcendent object as scientists because will be presumptuous and it'll just destroy us. Like you could easily, and you know, there's some reason to think that way because God only knows what you're going to discover scientifically, but that isn't how scientists orient themselves. They think, well, we're following our internal logos and we're making contact with the logos of the world. And if we do that diligently and ethically, then the result will be good. That's a replication of the biblical pattern. My secularists never have a view of freedom. Because cause and effect is always looking back. Right. And you can't look forward to the scientific method. Yeah, well, and that, well the, this, the thing is, in, in some sense, at that point, science devours itself because I don't think there's any credible scientific evidence that we're deterministic. And I think there's a fair bit of credible scientific evidence that not only are we not, but we can't be, well, and neither is the world. Well, it's more that there can't, couldn't possibly be scientific evidence that we are free. Because the determinist just says, it takes takes a step of faith and says that all of our actions can be explained, all our behavior can be explained in terms of physical causes and physical effects. But the person who believes in free agency just says that's not an exhaustive account of how we act. Mm-hmm. Now, there's no scientific way to settle that. And you might say, look, I believe that I'm free. I believe that I can lift up this cu- cup. Mm-hmm. And I believe that more firmly than any skeptical argument well, you could bring. Pen- Penrose, determinist- Penrose certainly believes that we cannot compute the horizon of the future deterministically. And so... Even if we don't have free will, <laughs> we have something that isn't deterministic because determinism per se doesn't work. But Penrose does believe in proofs. He comes up with the famous Hawking Penrose singularity theorem behind, yeah. the, behind the Big Bang. So you can, he, and he's a kind of Platonist as well. I think we talked about talked about this before. So if you're a kind of you can, you can say that there are mathematical proofs. There are proofs well, in the kind also of timeless a platonic heaven. world. Sure. But they couldn't be in this, as it were, in the physical order. So, you know, we'd be perfectly happy giving kids mathematics textbooks from the 1950s if they could still kind of understand them. We'd be very worried if we were giving kids physics textbooks from the 1950s because science is moving along all, all the time. And so there does, that, that there's just not, you know, that skepticism is healthy in scientific inquiry. In fact, you can almost guarantee that science is going to be very different in 20, 30, 40 years' time. And yet it's, beca- it's acquired this kind of sacred status, scientific sacred. knowledge, a kind of, uh, this is actually the source of all certainty. Well, science is actually the process, not the consequence in some real sense, right? And you sound like a science denier. <laughs> well, certainly, well, one of the things you learn, Thomas Kuhn pointed this humbler. out too, is that it's very. Di- you cannot teach people to be a scientist by. You cannot teach a person to be a scientist by teaching them scientific doctrines or scientific facts. Because people like to think of science as a collection of facts. But if you look at how science is practiced, it's as actually primarily a system of apprenticeship. So you go into a lab with a scientist who's a practitioner and a researcher, and you learn in an embodied sense how to conduct yourself as a researcher. And most of that. Some of it's technical, some of it's administrative, but a huge part of it is ethical. And that's especially true on the statistical front, because if you don't treat the revelation of your experiment 100% ethically, you won't discover anything that's real and you'll warp your career and the scientific enterprise. So fundamentally, what you're apprenticing in is an ethic of, an ethic of, humble, of humble approach and, and responsibility. And that's the embodied training as a scientist. And no one says that really in a scientific paper because it's a given. But 
but it's not it's not an obvious given when you start to think about it philosophically. This is also the thing that, that Larry was bringing up last night about teachers being taught teaching methods rather than having a mm-hmm. philosophical basis from which to teach. And we see this a lot it's in Hollywood where, to method. Right, mm-hmm. where there's a lot of courses and programs and degrees and certificates that teach you writing and you can study writing all the way through, but then you have all the skills and craft of writing with then what are you going to write about? Because you've only been studying how to write, mm. right? And this is part of that. You and I, we talk about this a lot about that, the dislocation between avatars of meaning and what they're supposed to be attached to. It's like there's this floating away and it's the, it's sort of like the senseless rote work that's removed from the undergirding meaning mm. and all these and fields. And the attempt to reduce to method. Mm-hmm. Well, in the ethic you talk about, the one of the maddest, maybe the only time my father got mad at me academically was in early high school and I was like debating, like fudging some results, exhausted at like two in the morning and nothing was working in a science lab. Mm-hmm. And he was like, there's no, like he was mad at me with the full fury of his Hippocratic oath as a, oath as a physician. It was like, you don't do that. Right. You don't do that. That's not allowed as something that you can do. Right. Well, that's well, and that I can't help but see that as a religious vow. It is. It's like and, I will and, not falsify the data, and that's the data. If it's real data, that's a pat. There's a pattern in that, and what the data represents is the transcendent object, and and, and that's a technical part of science because you're trying to falsify your hypothesis and the, not to support it. And the key for the liberal arts education is, of course, that every field that you enter into has a different ethic that is beholden to something that's greater, and if we elevate the individual the level that they travel everywhere that they go, you're no longer engaging in science as a scientist who's subservient to scientific values and ethic. There's all these different value sets that are your moorings. How do you read a text? How do you approach mathematics? What's acceptable scientific process, right? Can it be reproduced in a lab? There's all these different forms in which you have to, and that's why you're talking about it as an apprenticeship. And it's like, of course it is. You're not learning the facts of it. You're learning to subjugate yourself to a higher set of ethics. And once you carry you into all of that, and you're more important of all the ethics, you have this crumbling because we don't you're not you're not chiseled around all the way of how you approach different things but and you're also you're also enjoined upon to sacrifice your allegiance to the previous order that's right because what you're trying to do in science is to just figure out why what you already know is wrong that's the scientific enterprise not to prove that it's right but but really to figure out if it's wrong then you might think too on the faith element, because that's really still what we're discussing, right, is that it's faith and this fragile faith that's not attendant upon proof. It's like, well, what takes you out of a tyranny? Well, if a tyranny is everything you know in the most rigid form, the only thing that can take you out of tyranny is the willingness to leap beyond that. So that's faith. And then if you're in the desert where you end up after the tyranny, even if faith brought you there, you think, well, what leads you out of the desert? And it might be the desire to return to the tyranny, but I would but if it's proper orientation towards the promised land, that's got to be faith too. It's like, despite we're, we're in the tyranny, despite we're in the desert, we believe no, we you are willing to put our lives on line for the notion <clears throat> that something better still yeah. beckons. But the truth is, anything you build, anything you build, whether it's a company, whether it's a country, anything that you build has to function on that model. You have to project a vision ahead of you, and then you have to, to fill it with body as you're moving towards that vision. And the founding of the United States is the same. This story has a beautiful and perfect parallel in the story of the Aeneid, where you have, at the end of the, of the Trojan War, you have Aeneas that is taken out of a catastrophe, carrying his father on his back like Moses brought his father father's bones out of out of Egypt and and he goes into absolute chaos out onto the waters meeting with the foreign the foreign uh, a queen and it's only this vision that he has this vision that is pulling him forward that he will found something which one day will become Rome. And he has no idea, right, what that is. It's an amazing moment. It's right at the end of the first half of the Aeneid, isn't it? At the end of book six. And Aeneas is led down into the underworld. It goes right down into the underworld. 
And well, then, then he's might... shown around by his father about all of the all of the, the the greatness of Rome that is to come, and this is why he should be. Mm-hmm. So he why. comes out of the yeah. of death, out of the out of the Red Sea, out mm-hmm. of the the out of the, the the realm of the dead, into this vision of mm-hmm. of Rome, and it's it is it's it's almost completely parallel to this this story. And so the Western culture is based on those two stories. Mm-hmm. And like the it, Western and... culture is based on this story, and and the story of Aeneas. And if you look at any mythical legendary version of England or of any country, they will always try to connect themselves. Like, how do we connect ourselves to the story in the Bible, to Noah, to to to, to Moses, somehow, or at least to Noah? Mm, and, and then how do we connect ourselves to Aeneas? Yeah, and, like, and like the Israelites, Aeneas is always complaining. He's always saying, no, I can't do this. Please help. Mm-hmm. And so this has got to come down. He, he so keeps what, needing. But can I descend from these sublime and grand to something very, very simple? There's a element here that's not in the text that I've always loved when I've heard Jews explaining it. And that is Moses raises his rod, the waters go back, and the people all go, and one man steps out and you celebrate him. I never heard his name till a Jewish friend told me, Nashon. And when everyone else hesitated fearfully, he stepped forward in faith, and everyone mm-hmm. happily followed him, and they no, and so one celebrate per, well, so his... There, that, that's an answer to a question that we were discussing earlier, too, is like, well, the, the invitation of God is proffered, but one man has to step forward and take it before everyone else will follow. And right. so it's a, it's a legend, but it's not in the Torah itself, but it's a very important legend. Yes, that's right. Exactly. By the way, I, I know, I know uh, I'm going to make sure you talk. I, I, I'm, I feel bad. He has a great stuff to say. I just want you to know of a fascinating Talmudic statement. God, the angels are joining the, the Jews in singing the song of praise and celebration and God rebuked them. This is in the Talmud. Mm-hmm. My creatures are drowning and you sing songs. I completely differ with this Talmudic uh, uh, thing. I have no problem singing songs when people who want to murder you die. But it is, it is just worthy of note <laughs> that the Jewish tradition post Torah had an issue with at least the angels singing along with the Jews. Just thought you'd find that fascinating. In a society rife with anti-religious ideologies, it can be incredibly challenging to ground oneself in what you know to be true and good. To keep from descending into distrust, you need to check out Hallow, the number one prayer app in the world with over 10,000 audio guided prayers and meditations that will give you the tools to combat the darkness and overcome with the light. With Hallow, you can explore different themes and types of prayer and meditation, such as gratitude, forgiveness, and centering prayer. You can also choose from different lengths of meditation to fit your schedule, whether you have a few minutes or an hour. With its user-friendly interface and hundreds of guided meditations, the Hallow app has quickly become a go-to resource for people seeking spiritual growth and healing. Download the app for free at hallow.com exodus. You can set reminders and track your progress along the way. So what are you waiting for? Download the Hallow app at hallow.com exodus. That's hallow.com exodus hallowed.com slash exodus for an exclusive three-month free trial of all 10,000 plus prayers and meditations. Well, just a few uh, a, a, a few thoughts on this last few minutes for our conversation. I, I think we need to be as much, as fundamental as faith is here, I think we want to be care- careful about the suggestion that somehow our faith is simply making a world. I know this, no one's actually mm-hmm. suggesting no, that. Right. Simply speaking, you, say, you said the invitation mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. what underlies it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it's not merely uh, an existential act. And, you know, we're talking about, about the, these questions of deep questions of physics, I think it needs to be pointed out just very simply, and listeners can go and, you know, read up on it, but very, very, very great scientists like Freeman Dyson and, and, and uh, Sir Roger Penrose, whom you mentioned, you know, simply do not believe that the, the empirical evidence suggests that, you know, things are deterministic. Um, but the thing is, we don't have to depend on empiricism, to, um, on empirical analysis, to know the, the truth of our agency or to, to grasp 
the fact of its being grounded in transcendental realities that we can grasp rationally. We don't need, we don't need science to know those things. And not, not science and empirical science. We need rationality. Um, but what I want to suggest is that in this, in this image here, this is, which is surely one of the greatest images of all literature, this crossing of the Red Sea. I mean, this is, this, it doesn't get better or bigger or more influential or more perennial than this, you know, few chapters or couple of chapters. Uh, there's this, wonderful sense in which, you know, in verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now, let's remember this is a refrain in the song that is a reminder of the transcendent sovereignty of the goodness of God, of the goodness of reality itself. And that's the principle that throws the horse and his rider into his into the sea. And there's a there's a there's a beautiful sense there, I, I think, just at a spiritual level. You know, when you think about, you know, the the the, the difficulties of life, your own sins, the burden of, of your existence, of the wrongs you've committed, you know, that there is a profound sense in that this is a an image of forgiveness, of the goodness of God over, you know, washing away, washing away our own weakness and wrongdoings and, and, and to remake the people, but also our own selves in, in light of that. And I just want to, to quickly make a note uh, for, for lis- listeners here. Uh, as so one if of you the, dispense with your own tyranny, you can cross the Red Sea. If and God, then, yes, mm-hmm, if God, mm-hmm. if, if it's, it's not we who dispense simply with it, but, but it's God's work, or it's mm-hmm. the, you'd say it's the goodness of the order of reality itself on to, to which we, to which we cast ourselves upon that can affect that that moment of forgiveness. And I just want to, to quickly note, because in, in, when you're talking about a text as iconic and as fundamental to our whole history of culture as, as, as Exodus is, and of this chapter in particular, in, its, in this amazing image of crossing the Red Sea, uh, it, is, of course, a, it is, of course, also given rise to all kinds of other works of art. And there's just one I want to point out for people, and that is many people have heard of the Messiah, of course, the work of Handel, but Handel wrote another biblical oratorio uh, called Israel in Egypt that, that dramatizes in musical form the story of Exodus, but which has, has as it were, its climax in the crossing of the Red Sea. And uh, the uh, I, I, and Miriam's song, sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea, which is positioned in handle as the, big, the, the, as it were, the climax of the whole story, but of which the refrain that comes again and again in these, in these gorgeous gathering, you know, thunderous chords, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. And I just want to note that, um, if anyone's interested, you can find many recordings, but my favorite, which I listen to full blast every Easter Sunday morning, is uh, the Monteverdi Choir under the direction of John Elliot Gardner. Um, uh, it is a sublime work, this sublime work of music. Turn it up, man, and listen to it on repeat. Okay, so, so Jonathan, this, this pillar issue, it just linked things for me together, like Matt, so, because here's something that's really worth considering given what we've been discussing. So imagine you cast a vision onto the unknown to to pull yourself forward in faith. Okay, so then the question is, where does the vision come from if it's a proper vision? And I would say the answer to that neurologically and psychologically is that it comes from the proper interplay between chaos and order. It, li- it really does do that because the order is what you already know and the chaos is what's yet to be learned, right? And there's a meaningful conjunction of those two. And I, I say meaningful because when those two are conjoined, that's when you get the experience of meaning, like you do when you listen to music, because it's partly predictable and partly unpredictable. And in a conversation that's compelling, it refers to what you know because you can't understand it, but it refers to what you don't know because it wouldn't be interesting. And when those are optimized, then this spirit of meaning that's pulling you forward and where what the spirit of meaning manifests itself in in its initial phases from the Jungian perspective is a vision of the potential future. And so the visionary experience itself is called forth by the pillars. Yeah, and so uh, the, yeah. The, I think the best way to understand it, it's dangerous because some of the terms, they, 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 beca- they can become a bit slippery. So you can have this notion of chaos as potential in which you're moving from your point of origin. Mm-hmm. And then the pillars would be something more like concentric and eccentric forces. Things that are pulling towards order or towards centrality or towards identity and things that are moving outside of them. So that way you have 
you have a, a sense of that which goes towards the strange and that which moves towards my own, right? And 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 so those are usually the way that if you if you at some point when you say well, you couldn't keep yourself oriented without that, could you? Because if if you weren't being referred back to what you know, you'd be completely disoriented. Yeah. And if you were only cast into what you don't know, you'd be completely so that would disoriented. Be, so mercy and judgment is would be a version of that. So mercy is that which I I extend openness in order to bring things forward to me, yeah. and I extend judgment in order to push things away from me. Mm -hmm. And so it's like I harden to push things away, and then they fragment. I open to bring things towards me, and they and they, they let's say so. Mm -hmm. Those two forces, like those two balanced. pillars, yeah, yeah, right. You have but, to find your problem. And this is something them. which is as much in, in in Christian thinking, and I've seen many rabbis talk about this idea of the right hand and the left hand of God. Mm -hmm. You know that this idea of bringing forward with the right hand, pushing away with the left hand, balancing that out in order to 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 let's say uh, rear a child, for example. You have to have those two balanced sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I got one question for all of you. I'm very curious if it'll strike you or not. Uh, verse uh, 20 in this chapter. 1520? Yes. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. You see any problem? I mean, she's not the, she's not the sister, sister of Moses. Moses. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that odd? I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm asking an open question. Mm -hmm. She's the sister of both Moses and Aaron. But why, why does it say sister of well, Aaron? Well, Aaron's the spokesperson, so is she being cast as the sister of Aaron because she's also the word here? She's I the, don't know. She's the, I, you may well, be right. Sim uh, symbolically, that, that would make sense. Or is that the further sense. down the, the chain as it spreads from Moses to Aaron to her? I mean, maybe that's the is there hierarchical connection. Is there significance in her being a prophetess? Well, he, well that, no, because he... he, he well, that's interesting because Aaron was described as prophet, but so was Moses. Mm -hmm. But so, also, but Miriam is a, a prophet that can use words, though, and, and song. So mm -hmm. maybe she's more assimilated. She's assimilated in that text to Aaron more uh, than to Moses. Uh, now, women couldn't be priests. Right, but they, they, right, but, but they, they, they can be, be a prophet. No, it, it is another example of, of Torah egalitarianism of the sexes, which I, I could drive you crazy showing you how many examples, but... Uh, anyway, I did not have an answer to my question. I, I just find it interesting. Intriguing. I have a question. Oh. Yeah. No, so, fine. Jonathan, so this is back to the narrative question. So you said that you project faith and then you fill it with body. Then you embody it. Is that right? So I was thinking about the structure that this amount of complexity in a text, like the way we're taking this apart and there's so much meaning is also part of why it's repeated again and again and again in the way I was saying is like is inherently in certain regards undramatic. Right, because it's speaking to the procedural and to the ritual. And so it's so interesting is it's we get through this big climactic action sequence, and then there's a poem or a song that's about what we just saw that describes what we just saw again. So it's like this is in some ways, if you're if you're giving screenplay notes on the Bible, this is like the it's like we're gonna tell you what happens, we're gonna show you what happens, and then we're gonna say what just happened, right? It's the worst yeah. way to dramatize something. <laughs> and what's interesting is is that's because the aim is not merely to dramatize, right? The yeah. aim is to encode. The aim right, is to create to ritual. Because would this right, song have been? Would, would, is this song sang ritually in the synagogues? Yes. Yeah. So that's part. So the text is, it's has a liturgical yes. aspect to and it, when you and do, it's said in the daily prayer. Okay. I know it by heart right. in Hebrew because it's in the daily prayer. And what the do you, What song? do you suppose? What do you suppose? All of you. What do you suppose that you you you. Like, I've been struck by this friend of mine, Murphy, Rex Murphy, and, and he has great poetic education, far deeper than mine. And one of the things that's so striking about Rex, I can't get him to do it often enough, is he can, he can spout off great swaths of poetry. And I was always cynical about that as a kid. Why memorize anything, I thought, because you could just read it. And, and, uh, and I didn't really know anybody who could do it, but then I met a few people who could, and it's phenomenally impressive. And he said that it deeply structures the way he thinks, having that encoded into it, you know? And so I'm wondering if you participate in these practices and you know these songs, it means you can sing the song. It means it can come out of you. It's in you in some real sense. It's not external anymore. And what I wonder what that does to us perceptually. And because that, that one of the things that shapes the way we perceive the world, literally perceive it, is by practicing habits because we see the world through our, our habits in some sense. And so you want to develop proper habits. And this, this joyful singing is a kind of habit. But I, I can't exactly understand what Dennis it does. Dennis was just saying before we started that if you write something down, he's writing something down, you remember it better. 
mm-hmm. right? And you remember it better if you write it down than if you type it or tap it in your phone. There's different ways that we're encoded to receive information. And what's so interesting to me with this is it's if you're trying to ritual, you seeing it's one version. So how do you build a mythology? So what is Star Wars? Is it a film? Yeah. Is it comic books? Yes. Is it spinoff TV series? Yes. There's all these different mechanisms for engagement because when something's a myth, it fragments out into all these different parts, right? And then it's sort of pellet shot through the culture to some extent. And and you could argue with Star Wars overly commercially so and a little bit cynically, but nonetheless, it's like that's how a mythology is built and moved through the land. And so this is a version of that in a lot of ways. It's like, here's the story. It's also a memory representation because one of the things you do if you want to remember something is, well, if you code it in poetry, that's an aid to memory because of the rhythm, because that's an aid to memory. And then the song, the melody is an aid to memory. And so if you tell the story and you act it out and you sing it, then it's much more likely that it's going to be remembered. And, and there's rules for how it's embodied and how you set a table and prepare a meal, mm-hmm. right? There's all these ways that it's it's in, it's in ingrained into the culture and all well, these different ways. Well, and that's ways. also uniting you, right? Because if you sing, that's one thing. But if you sing and everyone else sings with you, then you're all, well, you're doing that. And everyone experiences when they say, this when they sing, if it's going well. Or you can at least experience it when you watch a bunch of other people sing together, is that you get this sense that, We're all together in the right place doing the right thing. And people, I don't think people, there's anything that people like more than that. It's, it's, un, yeah. that's celebration yeah. and worship yeah. in celebration the fundamental and it's, sense. And it's making a body. It's all happening together. This idea that we recognize each other. So standing in front of the flag, doing, you know, like putting your hand over and, and, and reciting the, the, or the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever you do, singing the national anthem. That's a perfect example of embodying the spirit of the nation as, you know, singing it together, all facing together, thinking of the same thing. It's like we're manifesting the reality of the, the unity, of the unity, that's because it. we, do, unity cannot be taken for granted. No, without, no, without no, not common, at all. Common purpose, we uh, we will and just well, fragment. Well, without a common, vi- yeah, without a common yeah. vision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So freedom and common choice. Oz and I were discussing this, where you said, "What was your phrase for the first set of the covenant?" That free- freely chosen consent. Freely chosen mm-hmm. consent. Right, right. 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 Fundamental right. The theme precondition for all good in the things. Bible. So I was thinking, as you're describing that, right? That's what's unifying mm-hmm. in a mind control mm-hmm. cult. Like when I went in to like to observe it, so call it undercover to some extent. You're in a giant conference hall, like in a ballroom at an airport, and everyone's in a giant horseshoe. And they say something like, everybody who's ready for change, stand up. Mm-hmm. And you're like, mm, that's disingenuous. Yeah. Right. But the pressure you feel yeah. when 500 oh, yeah. people stand up and you're sitting yeah. is incredible. Yeah. And so that's back to pluralistic ignorance, which we discussed. You can even feel that it. a little bit in the performance when everybody yes. gets on their feet to clap. And yeah, you think, well, yeah. maybe not a standing right. ovation. It's like, who are you to deny right. this, yeah. the enthusiasm that well, grips the crowd? And it's a statement also to say, no, I don't like cats. Like, yeah. I'm not going to stand for, I'm not doing a yeah. standing ovation yeah. to cats. It's a statement in the inverse, right? Yeah. Not to pick on cats, but it's cats. But it's also relative to your, your point about the dramatic arc, Greg. You know, it's... It's one thing for us to read the text and say, oh, well, they say it was going to happen, and then it happens, and then they talk about and sing about what had just happened. But, but, it, but from the standpoint of the Israelites, it's, 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 it's somewhat different, and here's why. Because you know, it's perfectly possible to go through a day of your life and not even think about it, right? You can go through and even have a, a traumatic or a beautiful experience and not even be aware of it, right? Because it's only in turning back and it becoming conscious that you actually understand what it was. Of course, the work of memory is to continually re-apprehend our memories so we understand them more and more truly, right? That's why therapy can, in fact, free you from a traumatic experience, not because the experience changes, but because your memory of it becomes more true, as it were, more accurate to what it is. And so I think one of the things that's going on here is is it's making the point that you can only understand by turning back look, and look at look, it. Look, the, the literature on that's absolutely clear. What pulls something into your memory isn't merely the repetition of it. That's pretty good for recognition memory. But for recall, what you actually practice is recalling. And so if you want to remember a text, what you have to do is read it, and then you have to close the text, and then you have to recall it. And it's the process of the recollection that drives that into your memory. Because it's easy to think that it's just mere exposure, repetitive exposure. It's like, well, that works to some limited degree, but really what you have to do to remember is to practice remembering. And prayer is like, I mean, the end end of the day, prayer, you, 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 you... 
say for what you're grateful for and you ask forgiveness for what you've missed, mm -hmm. it's like that's exactly what it is. It's going back over the day and then, okay. out, you know, and, and, and thanking for what you've been given and, and kind of you, bowing down for that which you've missed. And it's like it's a way to re to, to revisit, let's pra say. Practice mm -hmm. remembering is a right. great practice way to understand what prayer is. Yeah. Would you say? Uh -huh. yeah. That was your phrase, practiced remembering. Right. That in a way is what prayer is. I think there's something even more interesting going on. There's sort of, there's remembering, there's looking to the past, there's this sort of sense of, of the historical formation behind us, this, behind the people of Israel, behind the story. But it's also, what's so striking is the second half of the song is, as it were, looking ahead. It's a kind of, it's, it's in a prophetic mode. Mm. So if you've got the, effectively the whole narrative of the book of Exodus distilled down yeah. into, the song, into the song, because yeah. they're looking ahead to the, mountain. the inhabitants of Canaan being uh, melt, uh, melting away. They're looking ahead to the mountain of thine inheritance. So they're looking ahead to Sinai. And then of course, right at the end, uh, there is well, the, the memory the, has the, the to be sanctuary. The, the memory right. has to be integrated mm -hmm. into the vision of the right. future. Yeah. Otherwise, the memory is not not good for That's anything. That's the vision. That's the sort we of don't the get to, We don't get to anything. It's like a preview for a movie, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have to go and set the expectations mm -hmm. of what we're going to receive. So we set the expectations. We're not arriving at a lot of new material mm -hmm. before we've been vetted mm -hmm. to know that we're going to receive it. But it's spoiling right. the story again, I suppose. That's right. Well, yeah. this this the thing we encountered yesterday with the bones of. Joseph being taken out of Egypt, that's also a recollection. Mm. And so you can imagine, and this, this makes sense clinically, because what happens when you get someone's memory in order is that they can bring the past into the future. They're not trapped in the past anymore. They can now bring the, they can now, they can now integrate the past with the future. That's what a functional memory does. It's not merely an accurate representation of the past as if it's an objective videotape, first of all, you can't do that because the past is too complex. If the memory of the past isn't integrated into the proper future vision, then it's not an adequate memory of the past. And then it will torture you. That's the other thing. It's not just that that doesn't work. It's that the unintegrated part of the past, so still coded at an emotional level, will haunt you until you integrate it into That's the Faulkner, a vision of the future. Right? That's Faulkner. Hmm. The past isn't dead. It's not even past. Mm. Right. That was Faulkner. Mm. Oh, I've been misattributing that to, to Nietzsche. Mm. Maybe I've been that. misattributing it to Faulkner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're probably yeah. both wrong. All right. So, shall, shall, okay. do yeah, we have good. anything else to say on the imagery of the closing of the sea over the Egyptians? Or are we... In the song. Or, yeah. Or yeah. either. In either place. Well, I... Just a, just a small point, really. It, it's interesting that the way that the, the song, that there's a kind of dissonance between the song and the reported events in chapter 14. So there are things that happen in the song, there are things that are described in the song that are actually not described in the prose. For example, it talks about you know earthquakes, the, the, the earth shaking and swallowing them up, but it talks about fire descending and so on and so forth. So it's it's as if talks about the dukes of Edom and the mighty men of Well, Mom. that's the sort of proleptic, prophetic bit. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't that the two traditions that are coming in, being integrated? I mean, if if well, here is we're talking about Esau. So like Edom is is uh, is Esau. So but I mean, I these mean, elements don't that don't match. Isn't there a theory, and Dennis, this is this will be your bailiwick. Isn't there a theory that that parts of these are taken from different traditions and they're combined, and so there's different pieces? And well, it, it, it's my bailiwick, but it's not. It's not what I generally. I, I, if you mean, uh, for example, the uh, the documentary hypothesis, is that what you're referring to? Of taking uh, Jehovah, uh, Elohim, P, priestly, yeah. Deuteronomic. This is heavily redacted. I, I'm, I'm not mm. a big fan of that. Uh, I'm very grateful that we don't so, talk about yeah. that. I mean, yeah, there's yeah, diff yeah, yeah. different <laughs> traditions, <laughs> verbal traditions that were chosen yeah. from and integrated in the story. And so there's like vestigial or pieces that don't match. they may have been match. filling in details that the pros yeah. didn't. I mean, yeah, that would be I'd like to take it at its face value. Yeah, I mean, I think you, know, you could take a historical critical approach, and, and, and there's been a lot of scholarship on this, I think, where you look at exactly the, the process of editing and what the, all the different presence of the different sources. But, but I guess a sort of not, theological not, not point would just be yeah. that the, the imagery is a kind of whole, there's a kind of kaleidoscope of images that goes well beyond the kind of the watery and, and the marine, as it were. And that may be, I don't know what the theological point is, that, that it's a kind of cosmic, well, but, uh, it's but back that, to Jonathan's the, point, well, that the kind also, of the cosmic chaos. That also and, happens and when we tell a story, cosmic chaos. right? Because when, when, when a novelist, Greg can speak on this more, but when a novelist represents the world, you're going to base it to some degree on your experience because you have nothing else to talk about otherwise, but then you incorporate all sorts of other things into the story that make it, in some sense, more than what 
It's two ways of looking at it. It's more than what merely happened. But there's another way of looking at it, whereas it's, it's a truer and more universal account of what actually happened. It's like, also the most inane, like, chiron that comes up at the beginning of a movie where they say, based on real events. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. as opposed to what? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. what's so, another option? Su- this super, is, super. Yeah. super. Like, <laughs> that's where great. You- right. By the way, I, yeah. I, I, I'm just curious, again, because I, I mentioned this earlier, and, and that's fine if it, you know, just stayed there and sort of died. Are you all comfortable morally, theologically, with celebrating the death of the bad guys? Well, I think it has that bifurcated element that you described, because on the one hand, Stephen pointed to this, on the one hand, why wouldn't you celebrate the death and demise of your own tyranny? Right? If you're thinking about this as a psychological story in part, so it's a spiritual journey, it's partly a representation of internal transformation. It's like, yeah, well, thank God we got rid of the prideful and tyrannical, deceitful part of ourself. And so you could celebrate that. But then when you look at it historically, you'd have to say, well, these are real people that are suffering. Right. And so that, and I'm okay with I'm okay there. with their singing the song. I'm just curious because I think a lot of people would have taken the, the Talmud's uh, outlook. Hey, they're still God's creatures and they still died. And so you may you be relieved, that? but you shouldn't be celebrating. Do, do, yeah. do you, is that your position, any of you? I, I think it's a question of levels, just like the Talmudic story, which is that there is a level at which I can celebrate. And there's also a level at which I can understand that there is a maybe a... There's another vision of this which I, where I do have to be careful not to think that there's an absolute duality in the world mm-hmm. and that these are people and completely only, evil I, and they're, they're, they're the sons fair, of the devil. And, and so it's like, I'm I can only Israel. Let, let, let me give a totally real experience everyone here has had and everybody watching has had. When you watch World War II films and Nazi, show, show, Nazi soldiers are killed, is it okay to be happy that they are killed? It's a very real question, uh, because I know I it's that the, it's somebody's son, Dennis, somebody's Dennis, I husband. Think if the, I think if the film is deep enough, you're not only happy. Because what happens is that the filmmakers have characterized the Nazis just as demoniac, ent- you know, soulless entities, but as people with whom you can make contact despite their corruption. And then when the death occurs, there's, there's a sorrow that goes along with it that's real. I think if it's if it's only celebratory, it's not a deep enough examination. There's a story a story about about John Lewis. Then it might be apocryphal, and I might be misquoting it. Which which let me just undermine the story a hundred ways. But I believe that this is right. That when he was on the bridge in Edmund Pettus, part of what their training was for nonviolence was to envision the cops beating them as boys, as sons, mm-hmm. and that was what held them in restraint. And that's what tax to a more to a transcendental value that can be transformational. So I say I offer that to Dennis Prager, Angel of Vengeance over here. <laughs> <laughs> but Dennis, you That's you're good. bringing in the problem of the casualties, the German soldiers. You could equally br- bring in the psychology of the victors. So you take the difference between a triumph positive, triumphalism negative. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And I, that's I've read taken Jewish so commentary is, saying... So, so, Oz, do you have an issue with the ce- celebratory song here? Not at all. Okay. There's one not thing in all. common here. But you don't just, want the triumph, triumph to become... Is that why? No, it's a celebration of the triumph. If it continues and also... becomes a triumphalist attitude to everybody, that's extremely dangerous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, there's a There's a technique that is at work here, too, which is... Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop to contemporary thrillers just just as a means of something that we're familiar with to tack back to it. But when when the primary Bond villain dies, he dies in the most excruciating fashion possible and last. That's one of the rules, yeah. right? Like you can dispose of henchmen in ways that are like amusing and interesting, and but like you reserve the most brutal death, and it's because they've earned it. I think in some ways, like you're asking about the Nazis, and the Nazis are always the go-to because it's so purely, right, routinizedly right. evil. Them. And right. it's a good example. But also here, the Pharaoh strengthened his heart so many times that, like, 
it, it is, it's, an, it's incredibly likely at this point that you would be okay singing a song maybe if they drowned. You know, he finally lets them go and then even then comes after them the next day. It's so much time that by the time he's arrived at his demise, he's the primary Bond villain. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, right, right, right. and there's amount of satisfaction. So there's a reason that. to be less. No, ironically, you have a reason to be it sets us up for satisfaction. This Bond villain didn't die. Mm-hmm. The henchman died. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's go to let's 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 cruise along here. So, so this is fifteen twenty two. So we're done with the song and we're done with the Red Sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So now we're starting to encounter the problem of the desert instead of the problem of the tyranny. And when they came to Merah, they could not drink of the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Merah, which I presume yeah, indicates yeah. bitter. Right. And the people murmured against Moses. As you said, this didn't take very long, saying, but they're thirsty, so like, give them a break. What shall we drink? And Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. I don't understand that. He can't say, no. So why does that happen? Why do the water, do do you know that? Do you you know why the waters become sweet? Yes. Why? Oh, because there, there are, there's potential which is not available to you in any world, any identity you can imagine, right? So you can eat certain things, but you can't eat rocks. The cows can eat grass, but they can't eat on a sugar or whatever. So it's like all beings have potential which is attributed to them. And that potential which is attributed to them can be understood as something like sweet water, water which can be integrated. But there's also a type of water which is bitter. It's salt water. It's it's the water that is not available to you to drink. So it's potential that you don't have access to. So the idea of putting a tree, so a structure, a tree is a structure. That's, it's a fractal structure. That's what a tree is. The, the idea of putting a tree into a structure in order to reveal the sweet waters Okay, it, and so and so you and need a Moses tree. You need a tree. You need a night. You need something. You need a structure in order to know what is available to you. What waters are sweet and what waters are bitter. Okay, and Moses is also cast here as the person who's capable of doing that. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. And to make what's bitter sweet. That's yes, right. Oh, and that's that's an echo of him being able to take his hand diseased and to make it whole again. I would presume again. It's so related. It's definitely related to that. With the snake and the rod is 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 in, in many ways related to this as well. But you have to think of them together. It's like, but surely no, I agree with all that. But surely the simple point is it's now drinkable. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. But it, so he takes. He's, well, that shows him as a master of water again. Okay. So, so it's the same water, right? I mean, that's made, it's like the water into wine, you know, in, the, in Jesus' first miracle. But it's the same water that was bitter that becomes sweet. I think this is a very important mo- thing that we're going to see again and again in the next mm. chapters. Mm-hmm. But you also uh, have be- stories in Scripture where, where sweet waters become bitter. And so the, the, best, the best story is in the story of Ruth where, uh, I forget, her name before she named herself Mara, but she, she loses all her sons and therefore her fruitfulness is gone. She doesn't have any sons. And so she said, from now on, call me Mara. I am the bitter waters. I am potential for no one. I don't have a husband. I don't have sons. I have become this bitter water. Yeah. And so I, I'm saying that's why I keep saying I, I never I can't always tell you all the references I'm pulling in order to, to to give you these these stories, but I'll do it a few times so you can trust me when I say this is I'm not just pulling this out of my hat. But I think what's so fundamental here is that it's like the same event in our lives can be a cause either for resentment or for redemption. And it's not, you know, you can be diagnosed with cancer and you can pray to God and God not take the cancer away, right? As that's that's but that that bitter but that bitterness in of casting oneself upon God's providence, upon the goodness of the re- reality, you might say, praying to understand it. It is amazing. I've seen this in my own that's the spirit life. Of how, Moses. How, that, that spirit of humility saying, what am I, what is this for? Is that, that, that bitterness of the water can become, can become sweet. Not that the pain or the difficulty is taken away, but that rather than resentment, it can become in a difficult way of, let's say, well, and Moses is properly guided by the pillars of fire and the pillar of cloud. And so that, that's, that's, that's another example of, of exactly what you're saying, is that if you're oriented in the proper manner toward meaning, 
in the highest sense that even what's bitter in the desert can become yes. sweet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy, but that's right. That's Definitely. what is revealed here. I think. Right. Okay. okay. I just want to read you maybe before we go further. I just want to read you something from Proverbs just to, to, to kind of hammer my point because and the relationship between this idea of the feminine and the relationship between the feminine and the potential. So in Proverbs five three it talks about the strange woman, the problem of the woman that is too far from you, right? And it says, for the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take a hold on hell. So this image of this water, this bitter waters, which is also the bottom of the world, right? This deep, this the, the place where no life is possible. The bottom of the sea, right? The bottom of the salt sea. And so the, the imagery is, is brought back here to kind of connect all these, these images together to understand the difference between the yeah. potential that is available to you and the potential which is dangerous and deadly and related to death. You know, I, I don't want to get a contrarian voice, but I think we have to start with the straightforward and the historical. In other words, God is bringing to birth a nation. And again, Dennis, you come in. As the Jews, as I read it, before we get to the covenant, well, we've had the liberation, exodus, the deliverance, that's number one. We're getting to the covenant, the law, and eventually to the worship and the tabernacle. But we've got this little bit in between. And there are three incidents. One, they need necessities of food, drink, and food. You have the water and manna. Two, they need some administration. You have Moses' father-in-law coming in to tell him to delegate and so on. And then three, they have to learn to fight an enemy. And so you have these three very basic things put in place, the necessities, as it were, and right. then they're given the covenant and the law. And I think you have to start with a very simple, straightforward... So you see that as part of the assembling of the new order at, yeah. at the most basic level. Yeah, mm -hmm. Take, start there with the history and the, the basics of it, and then you see the rich, deep meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so let's go to... They're the not things. exclusive, I think. No, no. Yeah. Not they're not too, at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. And, and he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Yeah, well, that's an unknown question, too, because, and everyone asks himself when they get sick, too, is like, have I done something wrong that's increased the probability that I have become ill? And it's a terrible thing to ask yourself because you add the moral burden to the catastrophe and you don't want to leap right to that conclusion. But it's also an open question is how healthy would you be if you were oriented constantly to the highest possible good? So, Well, it's a terrible danger, though, in that, too. It's, it's a very tough issue. Yes, it's terrible. Because it's terrible. It's, it's the issue it is of tempting Joel. for people, true, exactly, and it's very tempting for people to then look at people who are sick and say, oh, that's a sinner. Yeah. And that, right, that's, right. that's very cruel yeah. and unjust and ungodly and everything you say. Just, I, I just want to just say, because I've dealt with this a lot, uh, God promises that if you keep the commandments, I will not bring any of the diseases I brought upon the Egyptians. Uh, the My general read of all of these, this worldly rewards is that it's collective and not individual. Because otherwise, God would be proven wrong in a day. He proved, God promised X, and look, Joe here has, uh, has uh, some terrible skin disease. So uh, it, it, it's collectively, I do buy it. Do you, do you think, Dennis, that maybe it's modulated by the fact that he's referring, God's referring here to the diseases, I presume it's the plague diseases. Oh, that's that, good. That's an, Well, in this case, right. that's a perfect And out. so they're associated yes. with tyranny, that, per se, the, the diseases okay. that tyranny bring. That's good. Okay, because okay. really it does, it does, it's very specific, That's right? Says, in this case it is, uh, yes. You're at least That's not right. going to be made sick by your own tyranny. So, and, and they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water. 
and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamp there by the water. So now they're back to a, a place of, of rich water. So this is back so, to Oz's point. But also of trees. So you have it put a tree in the bitter water, you get sweet water, then you get a you get trees and water. You get twelve wells for the twelve tribes and 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 the and the trees. So it's like a uh -huh. it's a multiplication. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, the seventy doesn't um, Moses appoint seventy elders later in in Numbers. So it's a sort of it's it's what Oz was talking about the constitute the, yeah, the constituting of the nation. The, yeah. the twelve tribes. Yeah, so and the dis the and the dissemination of of authority, right. yeah. and the distribution proper distribu distribution of authority in this tree like structure too. Okay, so sixteen one, and they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The prophet and the politician are no longer ha are popular. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So now they have nostalgia for the tyranny already. And the flesh pots, when we sat by the flesh pots, do you know what that's, a, anyone know what that specifically is a reference to? To, to the meat or fish that they ate. In, okay, in so Egypt. it's a food reference. Yes, you food. know, this repetition okay. reminds me a little bit. You were saying it's, you know, it's three minutes before they're complaining again. Mm -hmm. It's interestingly, it's the other side of the Pharaoh whose heart is constantly hardened, right? Mm. And it's like, it's the same thing. It's just this mirror image of mm. it. Mm. Because at some point you're like, guys, come on, like give us two more verses before you complain, right? It just happened. It was working out okay. So you think okay. in some sense their heart isn't hard enough? Their, their, will isn't, their will isn't congealed enough in this scenario? There. I don't. I, I just. I think it shows Maybe the impossibility of, of prolonged faith, mm -hmm. right? And it's like it's trying to. It's at least they're trying to find and access a faith that has to do with something that's greater than them, instead of a hardening faith internally. Well, well, they also have slavish habits at this point, you know. And and we were trying to give the Pharaoh his due, and one of the things we did say was was that his will was in fact strong. And the opposite of that, it's not, your will can be too strong, it can obviously be too weak too. And it, it's certainly the case that the Israelites' will in this situation continually is too weak. I mean, they're not only whining about the fact that they're in the desert, even though it's not been that long since they had the trees in the water, but they're literally longing for the days of the Pharaoh. And you can't, you can't see that other than bitterness well, and resentment. Ten, 10 plagues, 10 commandments, and you have 10 complainings. Mm -hmm. You count them all. Oh, and really? Th this is the example, as the rabbis say. It takes the Lord one day to get them out of Egypt and 40 years and counting to get Egypt out of them. Right, right. This okay. is another so example. It's, it's, oh, so it's, ten, it's, it's sequences of 10, eh? It's shaking yeah, out the internal tyranny now that the literal tyranny, they're free of the right. literal tyranny, so they're shuddering yeah, it out yeah. of them. That's really helpful. So, so the psychology of disobedience really is just running all the way through the entire book, and we're probably shifting from... And faithlessness. Yeah, that's right. And we might think of, you know, we might see in Pharaoh ourselves and our own stubbornness and obstinacy and, and sort of persistent disobedience. And I guess now Pharaoh has disappeared and now we're invited really to think of ourselves as the people of Israel and that yeah, well, obstinacy. And I, I think, well, and I think we're starting to be invited to see our weaknesses in the desert. It's like we're no longer in a place of order now, even though there might be dawning order, we're in a place of chaos and doubt. Yeah. And so what what is the one of the biggest sins that tempt in in the desert of doubt it's it has to be this faithlessness and the des yeah. and the desire for the yeah. return to yeah. a tyrannical what, what, what order what immediately follows liberation is not the promised land but but no. but a kind of complete absence of, of creation a wasteland an, mm -hmm. an apocalyptic wasteland mm -hmm. and, and the, well you know, and 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 psychologically it's it's clearly the case that when a uniting structure de de deteriorates People say, freedom, freedom. It's like, no, that is not what happens. What happens is chaos, anxiety, terror, bitterness, disappointment, frustration, especially if it's imposed upon them. And, so, that, and that's why I think it's very important that just at the end of that chapter, there's a strange mention of ordinances, you'll keep the commandments mm -hmm. you know, before they've actually been given. There's a sense that freedom can't just be 
complete anarchy. This is a point that's come back again and again in our sem- in the previous seminars, hasn't it? That, well, it's that, completely stressed, continually that, stressed in the text that right, it's not right. freedom. It's needs not, structure. It's not freedom it from order. structure. Yeah. No, yeah. that's the, maybe that's the, that's the desert. Is mm. the absolute desert is freedom from structure. Right. Right. And maybe that's the preparation. Maybe that's why we're hearing the story and the rituals and the laws before it happens. Mm. Because you're, you, you have to have some preparation. If you're free of the, of the literal external tyranny, but you're going out in the desert alone with your internal tyranny, what they're doing in some ways is saying, hey, training wheels, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty soon there's going to yeah. be a Red Sea. You got to build a meal that looks like it. it's like giving some of the structures to try and to, for the 40 years to well, get Egypt you, out. Well, you, you do, you do see, I, I think you do see that with the, the, the beginning of the construction of the ordinances and so forth that do orient people. These new What's structures. coming is going to be ordered freedom. And hmm. Reinhold Nebo is very strong on this. The bookends of history, authoritarianism, all order, no freedom. Hmm. That's Pharaoh. Or anarchy, all freedom, no order. Hmm. And what you're going to have is an ordered freedom within the government. Right, right. Well, and that's and well, that, that ordered freedom. That used I would to be say the genius of the American experiment, an ordered freedom. That's what's it, gone. It's mm-hmm. also the case that the wilderness- well, genius. Sorry, sorry. Just one one note on that. Genius. That's a genie, and a genie is ordered freedom because the genie is contained in a container but has an infinite capacity, and so. Mm-hmm. It's also the case that the wilderness is going to prove to be a place of of, of revelation, and. You know, I think it's it's very interesting, you know, how resistant we are to quiet, right? Because you know, the wilderness is outside of the city and the, the hustle and bustle and, and noise and so on. And it's very interesting how hard it is to get to a point of quiet where you can hear the voice of God or voice of revelation or your own conscience or whatever. And, and you know, I think even I have had long-standing struggle to not be too dependent on my phone or not to be constantly checking it. And of course, these things are designed exactly to, to prey on our, our, our fundamental neurological structures and so on. But, but, but it's very interesting, you know, if you try and say, okay, that's it, you know, I'm putting it away. I mean, it's very, you know, the, the habits to so quickly, you know, there you are reaching in the pocket or th- flicking the thing open, it, the habits, that, that, that we have that will keep us from the solitude and silence. The technological tyranny. It is, in which we... And the quick in, comfort yes, through there. Yes, I mean, let's, let's, not, let's not pretend that somehow, you know, we can have these, romantic, these romantic ideas about, about revelation and being a monk or whatever, but mm. it's, it, it's hard to be in the desert, and even if it will later prove to be the place of revelation. Yeah. Well, I noticed this with kids, too, you know, um, very often when we took our little kids over to other parents' houses, they would put their little kids and our little kids in front of a TV and have all the little kids watch the TV. And the reason for that was that they didn't want the kids to, and they want to amuse the kids, but they didn't want them squawking and complaining, well, the adults were doing whatever they were doing. But the problem with that was that the kids wouldn't spontaneously generate fantasies in response to the desert. So if you throw kids into the basement, so to speak, and you leave them alone, Mm -hmm. they squawk and complain about it for a bit, but then then they play. And so what happens is they generate it. This is what happens with children. They generate a uniting fantasy that brings them together, but they won't do that without a certain amount of privation. And we used to have our kids too, and this isn't unique to us, but we'd put them in the room alone and they would crab about it briefly. And and when it first started happening longer, but eventually what would happen is that well, their imaginations would ignite and they'd play with whatever was in there and they'd get deep into a fantasy play, but they wouldn't get that revelation without the desert and without the distant from, distance from the clamor and, and attraction of the, of the tyranny. Hmm. So I think the overriding lesson, if I just may, which when it hit me was a way of explaining the contemporary world human nature and the Israelites are human first. It's very important to remember that. We would all do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We do the In same human, thing. <laughs> right. All the time. All the, yeah, yeah. Human nature does not yearn to be free. It yearns to be taken care of. That is why freedom and free countries are so rare. We do, the, the people don't yearn to be free. They yearn to be taken care of. And that's, so they'll de- that's at least very, they'll very, default. They'll default the, to that. Yes. Yeah. And and that is why America has been a miracle, in, in, in the sense of of such an outlier in human history, 
a free country, a big free country. And that is why it is very hard to sustain because, again, people yearn to be taken care of. And, and, that, and no that, wonder, especially when they're in the desert. So now, even when they're not in the desert, forgive me. Fair enough. We're not in enough. the desert in America, and people yearn to be taken well, Steve, care of. It's Stephen's point with the phone. You know, I was thinking about like we don't know how addicted we are until you put your phone away for a week and just watch your brain itch and watch your hands move. Like it's all in our nervous systems, and that's a tyranny. That's a lack of freedom. If you're free to do whatever, you could sit down and read. And the, the itch is perfect because the image of murmuring is is a beautiful image. The people murmur, like the people are rah, 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 just like grumbling. We don't have what we should, like a, like a drug addict that is like, I need my hit. I agree with the second part of what you said, yearning to be cared for. Do you not believe people yearn to be free too? I think you've got to put those or, two together. Oh, I, I, think you're, I think the number one is yearning to be taken care of. I think the founders of America knew that. And they, and they try to protect liberty as best as possible, most especially by dividing powers, because they knew, as you had mentioned, Lord Acton, they knew that power corrupts. Uh, what I said Maybe is... Maybe it's that the cost of freedom is responsibility, mm -hmm. right? So you have to take that on. Even if people do yearn, toward, yearn towards right. it, there's a cost but, for it. Absolutely. Yes, like, look... Vote for me, I will give you a free lunch. I will give you free and then add on any noun you want. Oh, I agree and with the And they will be elected. And, and, but it's, it's, it's from Mephistopheles. It's a, it's, it's a diabolical deal. I'll give you X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and D. You give me your liberty. Oh, there is a counterposition to that. I mean, you can, you can appeal to people politically, even within the current political landscape, by stating to them that there is something better that can be offered to you by your political system than mere security and comfort, and that you may lose something by, by taking that gift. There's lots of people to whom that message also appeals to, I, as, I, as I you agree, know. I suspect they're at this table. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, so shall we, shall we proceed? Okay. Then said the Lord, this is relevant to our discussion, that a revelation of something of value can occur in the wilderness if the wilderness is accepted, if the desert's accepted. Then the, said the Lord, it's a good way of understanding manna. Then said the Lord unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread, bread from heaven for you. It's a very particular kind of bread, heavenly bread. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Now you can't store this up, right? You can't, you can't keep it. Yeah, it's your you daily ha bread. You, you have to be open to it. Yeah, it's your daily bread, okay and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them, whether they walk in my law or no. So they're willing to be, in the desert, you have to be continually accepting of the revelation of the day. It's something like that. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. That keeps the cosmic rhythm of the Sabbath possible. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, at even, then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord. For he that heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and that's the whole blind crowd, right? Crabbing away. And, and what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, this shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, so they confronted the wilderness. They looked toward the wilderness. And then, behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, 
there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. I presume that the word manna has some relationship to something that's mysterious. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer, a certain measure, for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it out with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according they gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Don't keep it. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rules of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and seethe that you will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm within. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days shall you gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. I hope you all understand it. It's to prevent them from gathering and working to get the manna on the, sh- on the, on Sabbath, the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Okay, fine. Yeah, and so, well, so what do we make uh, we, we've kind of touched on this. What do we make of the fact that this bread appears miraculously in the desert? It's like, well, first, if you're in the desert and you're open to revelation, so you're in a dismal period in your life and your internal tyranny is collapsed and you're bereft, if you're open, you can find, you may be able to, you may be able to find that which will nourish you even in the desert of the soul. So that's partly what's happening here. And partly... You need to concentrate optimally on the day when you're in the desert so that the f- bread that falls from heaven is available for your nourishment? So the, the, the way, like at least the way to understand it, if you want to understand it a little more spiritually or a little more, is, is to understand that it's the bread that comes from heaven. It's related to the, to the revelation of God. It's right. Mm-hmm. It says the glory of God appeared in the cloud and then this bread started to appear in the morning. So the beginning of the day, it's like that's the notion of the daily bread in the prayer, the Christian prayer, which is that, that when we say daily bread, we it's, it's even it's like transubstantial bread is the actual like translation about it. It's as if it's the thing you receive to the day to guide you. It's like a seed. That's why it says it looks like a coriander seed. It's in the seed form. And so it's like that's it's sort the, of it's sufficient like the, the, unto the, the day. Sufficient unto the sufficient day. Unto the right. day. And so yeah. think about uh, sufficient unto one cycle of whatever you want to apply it to, a cycle of a world or a week or a day. In this case it's a day. Okay. But so then it but it also has to leave room for that fringe. It has to leave room for that day where you don't that, that there's, there's like a... There, where you rest. That's right. Okay, so one of the things that happens in the Sermon on the Mount is that Christ tells his followers that if they orient themselves properly to God, and so that would be toward the pillars, let's say, if they orient themselves to themselves towards God sufficiently, then they can pay attention to the day properly, and if they pay enough attention to the day, the way what reveals itself in the day, that's how to set everything right. Yeah. And so... There's this radical opening up to possibility in the highest possible sense, and that's to, to, to follow the guiding spirit of God, and then, then sufficient unto the day are the troubles thereof, and the revelation yeah. thereof. And so you can, and in the story, it, 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 it'll become clear a little later when we talk about the quails, but it, it's, you can see it, it's like a seed and a body. It's a bre- bread that comes from heaven in the morning, and this, this flesh that is in the evening. So it's actually a giving body of the day. You start with the seed, you end with the body. 
You know, and that's, it's one of, this is one of the images for the Eucharist. Like, it's one of the images of this idea that Christ joins the end and the beginning together. I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the bread and the flesh. You know, I'm the manna and the quail. It's like all together in one space. But this is this, it's the cycle. Like, it's this idea of like moving towards the end of the day. You have the flesh, at the, the, the seed at the beginning, the flesh at the end, mm. and then you start over. So whatever world, that's how it works. Like you start with the seed, you end with the flesh, with the body, and then Well, the you... day, okay, well, that's also partly because this is how things work psychologically. Well, the, the morning is the horizon of potential. I mean, you wake up and you think, well, what am I going to do today? And then by the end of the day is when the day is over. Right. And, and so the day has the day. become what it was going to be. And it isn't, it isn't something new anymore because that's new thing is the next day. And so we do have this repetition of beginning and end. And so that's your point, is that it's potential and fulfillment yes, and embodiment. Orientation and embodiment. So you right. orient yourself in the morning and then you evaluate at the end. Right. And then you de you decide what to embody. So that's part of the prayer idea, is that when you reevaluate what you've done during the day, you're separating out the wheat from the chaff so that you embody the best of the day. And that's what you do when you recollect and remember. Yeah, and the remembering is an organization of the body. Yeah. Mm. Little less wow. judgment. So that's every a really day. that's a really useful I, way of thinking about prayer. So you go over your. I found you know, I found a, a technique that always helped me sleep. If my if if I was having a difficult time sleeping, I would start at the beginning of the day, and just walk through the day. Mm -hmm. And generally, I found that if I did that, then I would fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And so, what maybe, if you had a really interesting day? Well. <laughs> Then it took a little longer, right? <laughs> right. But and but those were often days too where it's harder to, to sleep. Right. But that was almost an unair, and I suppose that was the dawning of an impulse, in some sense, towards prayer, mm. right? If prayer is that recollection and remembering, right. and, and, it, and it is that in a daily way here, right? There's there's people talk about the importance of you know gratitude journals and things like that, not just mm -hmm. like once every yep. five years. Yep. It's the it's the it's the it's the quotidian, the daily. Mm -hmm. The daily remembrance. This is the daily remembrance of God's goodness. I mean, that's well, what this and is. Well, gratitude's a and, great and image. The gathering Stephen, up of because it. it's also gratitude is the antidote to bitterness in yeah. the most fundamental sense. It's like, and I suppose it's also what can I, what can I glean? What can I glean from the day? That's a good prayer at, at the end the of the antidote. night, and you do embody that. If if that's the conclusion you draw, right, and the moral you extract. And the point for the future, that is the gleaning of what's been offered to you in potential from the day. And the, also the orientation of the morning. Yeah. Hmm. The or in what well, sense? Well, in the sense that the man, the, the man is the morning, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, the man is in the mm -hmm. morning, right? So you go out in the beginning, and it's this moment of thankfulness, of yeah. awareness, right. of, yeah. of, of, of of God's goodness mm -hmm. that is the, the beginning point of the day and on That's which like you, you live. That's like the day. It, that, is a, that is actually the subs, the sustenance that you need to carry out through the day. It's what allows you to, to, yeah, to move. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And you want to be oriented properly for that, or you dread the day, too. And so you can, you can see... An appropriate prayer in the morning, obviously, is something like, God, grant me the wisdom and ability mm -hmm. to utilize the potential of this day properly. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, I suppose to embody the benefits of that by the end of the day and to make that a practice. And, a, mm -hmm. and so you build yourself out of that which you glean from the day. Mm -hmm. right? I think the greatest mm -hmm. poem in English on prayer ever written is called simply Prayer by George Herbert. And I just remembered just now, I've just pulled it up. Uh, this is how it starts. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his breath. The soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage. Then just jumping ahead a little bit. It, the different ways of thinking about prayer. Exalted manner, gladness of the best. Heaven in ordinary, man well-dressed. Church jumping ahead a little bit. Church bells beyond the stars heard. The soul, the soul's blood the land of spices, something understood. It's a, all of those phrases have become, become almost proverbs in, in English, but that phrase, hef, exalted manner and heaven in ordinary is just, is just perfect. Because we've seen all these really dramatic instances of God's miraculous intervention, the most obviously in just four, chapters 14 and 15, but also with the plagues. This is just a, it's not really an ordinary miracle, but what it provides us couldn't be more ordinary. It's the, you know, the day-to-day -day sustenance, as you were right. saying, Well, and it's in, it's in tiny little portions too, right? Because yeah. it says like it's hoarfrost. And so you might say, I, I wonder if that's what I was pointing to in some sense. I wrote this chapter in my first book about 
stopping to pet a cat on the street, if, especially if you're in dire necessity, right? It's like one of the things you have to do when you're in dire necessity is look for tiny miracles. Mm -hmm. And they are, mm -hmm. and that's really the case. It's but really it, but, sustaining but under it, but, those but it's, conditions. It's not necessarily looking for miracles, looking for sort of miracles understood as just extraordinary or completely bewildering events. That's probably the no, wrong no, that's mindset. why they're tiny. You often will get some religious, sort of zealous religious believers, just looking for, searching for the, the signs and wonders, as it were, mm -hmm. and not being willing just to accept, as I think you know, Dennis said brilliantly in the, our first seminar, that you know, the, the birth of an ant is yeah, a miracle. Right, right, right. Being able to see the miraculous in the mundane. And this is a guard against a different tyranny, the fact that you can't gather too much bread, right? And that it stinks and it goes sour because there's a tyranny. You talk a lot about sacrifice. We sac like what work is, is we're sacrificing the present for the future, but that can also, you can sacrifice the present too much for the future. Yeah, then, right? then you don't, then, then you're not then you're sacrificing it completely. Right, right. and part of what and Dennis was talking about. That's a lack about, of faith too. That's yeah. right, because you're, and then you're locked in. Yeah. You're just as hard That's also the worship of mammon. That's right. right. And so, but, you know, Dennis talking about the importance of the Sabbath to say, we'll have a family day every week. And you keep saying, but you won't. Mm. Right, and so to have this to say, you have to go forth in every day, you have your bread, mm. but you're not gonna have your store for the whole year or just keep working to fill your stores up, to fill your bank accounts. Mm. That's not another way, that's another kind of tyranny. Mm. And so, so the limitation of it is also a protection. I would say that I the, right. to the degree yeah. that the left has a moral claim against capitalism, to the degree that that's the case, that's the part of it that's right, is that don't be thinking that you can store your treasures on earth, right? That's that's the accusation of the left when it's when it's properly constructed. And that seems to me, well, in this sense, that's a reasonable that's a reasonable objection. It right. takes adventure out of your life as right. well, right? Because right? you need to you need to want in the day. Mm -hmm. Right. And so sometimes if you have a certain level of financial success, right? It's weird. It, it can be disorienting in a way that's weird because there's a different kind well, of freedom. It, 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 it deprives you of optimal deprivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't even mean huge. I mean, like maybe you parent. paid off your car after 20 years, like, and all of a sudden it's, so, it's some new thing, but your order of priorities reorients in a weird way, but you need to have everything not taken care of too much all the time in every way, because you need to, you need to get hungry you need to go out and conquer new things and have different adventures. Like you don't want your bread lined up for the whole yeah, week. Yeah, well, security is the is the antithesis of want in some sense, but you could also say that security is the antithesis of adventure. And trust, and here I think the message is trust and faith, faith in God, faith mm -hmm. in God to provide not just an, a, a one-off, you know, yeah, well, manner from heaven, but yeah. a kind of continual sort of relationship. Well, that's what happens in the Sermon on the Mount too, because yeah. there's that insistence, because it's not a pay to hippie virtues. It's like, well, just forget about the future. It's not that at all. It's orient yourself to what is the highest in like completely. And then you can risk paying proper attention to the present. All the rest will be added unto you if you seek first the, the kingdom. Well, then heaven. you have faith because you've oriented yourself. You've, or you've oriented yourself and your community and your habits and your home and your table mm -hmm. and your family mm -hmm. in the world in a certain way. And that then, then you produce. Can Right. And well, can, then it's a garden. It's a walled garden. Right. And, and so it'll bring forth the that's fruit, right. right, that keeps that's you right. alive. Instead right. of just anticipating mm -hmm. that you need to have all of these resources and material things. You right. don't want that. Well, you that want is, an orient, well, do you, you, you want, want a, Do you want a pile of apples or do you want a garden? That's right. And right. you want an orientation towards the world in a way where you have sufficient confidence in yourself and the structures around you that if things get difficult, that you can still find sustenance. Right, right. And you don't have to get grasping and greedy under those circumstances. And again, yeah, so desperate mm -hmm. and lawless. And mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I love the way that there isn't any deprivation. I mean, it's not a kind of rival. Mm. It's not like a sort of an oppressive regime of laws that comes in in the wake of of the oppressive regime of of Egypt. Right. That is to say, and it's you know, not a life less abundant. Yeah, you've got to store up for you, so that you take you. You can't work on the thou shalt not work on the Sabbath, but that that but that does not mean that you, you're not going to be able to enjoy. Uh, mm -hmm. Enjoy sustenance, right. and and right. and it's. I think later on, I think there's that wonderful detail where it makes it very clear. It's strange because the Sabbath, as it were, has been given before we get to the Ten Commandments. But when we do, we see that the Sabbath applies, if I got it right, Dennis, it applies to all. It's just, it's the slaves as well, the slaves they've got with them. So it's not like Egypt. This is, this is a ordered freedom, as you were saying, ours. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, and then so, so imagine if the idea is that 
you orient yourself to the highest good and you build those intervening structures, those intermediary structures, then not only will you get enough, but you also won't get too much and you won't have to strive to get too much. And so that's definitely what this story is emphasizing in relationship to the idea that you can't, that it's not optimal to depend on it being stored up. And that's an indication that it's not optimized. So because you're, you're, you're not, you got to go out setting it up so it's productive optimally. Yeah, and it softens you. Like you got to go out and use your claws and your teeth. Right. Right, right. That's a hard thing to do with your kids when you have a lot. Because you can That's just right. give them everything. That's right. And then it can be arbitrary where you're like, well, because of some right. co- abstract concept mean. of materialism, yeah. we, I don't want you to have what it is. And so the, you need the proper orientation to everything. Mm. Yeah, well, the whole idea of optimal deprivation is a very interesting idea, right? I mean, that's also part of the reason there's an injunction against gluttony. Well, and resentment is always relative deprivation is what is more. I mean, remember those experiments where they have the monkeys in the cage yeah. and the monkey's performing a task and he gets a peanut and he's quite happy and then the neighbor performs the same task and gets a banana. Then you go to the first monkey and he has a fit if you give him a peanut. Mm-hmm it again Mm -hmm. and loses his mind. And so relative Mm -hmm. deprivation and populist resentment games that are played, that's why it's so effective because it's always relative to other people, whether fictional or real, because that's how we gauge things. And so deprivation is sort of like, it's such a key marker of particularly masculine identity in a lot of ways. It's an orienting factor. And so managing what is too much, what's a proper amount of deprivation, what isn't enough, what are the conditions under which everybody should rise to some extent but not have too much from it, like those are all the conversations that we're trying to have in reorienting a well, society yeah. well, where... Well, even the, the conflict between the liberals and, and, yeah. the, and the, especially the libertarian conservatives is more... It's the, it is the conflict between the security that takes care of everybody and the challenge and adventure that forges their soul, right? And there's obviously some optimized balance of that, and it's worth arguing about. And how do you bridge it to bring people up who need... Adva- maybe they need some version of greater resources or access and resources can be intellectual can be moral mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. have yes, them enter into something the spirit. to remember on the liberal front especially the social engineering liberal front even though the conservatives can fall prey to that yeah, too it's probably the key question in political philosophy at the moment um distributive justice do you want to ensure that everybody has enough or do you want to ensure that everybody has the same or something similar right. and, mm-hmm. and greg's absolutely right that you know that it's deeply wired into us to relative deprivation to see things to, to want what somebody else has to, to feel somehow that one is losing out. So you make that aspirational and mm-hmm. fair, great, yeah. right? But if you do that and pull the ladder up after you yeah. and you corrupt the system, it's not <clears> fair. <throat> it's tyrannical. Yeah. That's the pharaoh. Then you won't get rid and of so that. And so it's instinct. like, oh, so there, so there's this, there's the the answers both sides morally seem somewhat clear. It's like enjoy and celebrate that system and that prosperity and make sure it's really fair and not corrupt because things are really hard. Yeah. And on the other hand, don't be reliant and ask only for as much help as you need to get to the starting line in some manner to then compete and forge your own future. And how do, how do we deal now with redistribution of wealth? Then every term becomes laden with consequences. But how that's the balance that we want to seek between the two sides. And that's the conversation that we have ineffectively and through a million buzzwords that are like dehumanizing and turning the other side into a monolith. But that's the balance that needs to be struck, I think. All right. Okay. 1625. And and Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days shall you gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, so they're greedy, I guess, or faithless. faithless. And they found mm. none. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they don't have the faith. It's right, seemed. right. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed. As, that's back to your point, Jonathan. Is coriander a very small seed as well? Yeah. And white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. 
And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth, fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, take a pot and put an omer, a measure, full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generation. So this is a storage of manna to, as, a sim, as a representation of what happened in the desert. Yeah, mm -hmm. which will end up in the ark. Of will the end up in the ark. That's right. Uh-huh. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. So it's, it's, it's the bread from heaven that descends from heaven, if your attention is properly oriented, that's in the holiest of holy places in the ark. Yeah, because even at the beginning, it was related to the glory of God. Like, that's where, that's how it was in, instigated it. And then it'll be related to the glory of God in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. Now, an omer, in case you were wondering, is the tenth part of an ephah. Oh, now it's clear. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering. Yeah. 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 Tie it back to the like ephah. The there. I, I think the point there is <laughs> so that it is it, is it an, a sort of an explanation from much, much further down the line, Dennis, so that it's that's a suggestion that this is a very ancient part of the tradition. That the, 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 that the measures need to be explained. That the, oh, yes, you're right. It isn't explained, so it was... By the way, those are the things that make me believe that the Torah is contemporaneous with its time. Mm. That it doesn't explain it means that the people who read it then knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. Exodus 17. By the way, an ephah equals 35 liters, just in case you're curious. Mm. Ah, so, uh, so an omer is, is three, three liters. Yeah, three, exactly. That's, that's a lot of manna. So By the way, just, I just want to say on behalf of the Israelites, who I, I share the Torah's view of generally, 40 years of manna is, is a challenge. I just, <laughs> I, I, I think we have to be honest here in, a, in assessing 40 years of the greatest pizza possible. So the rabbis, the rabbis, actually, you'll love this, the rabbis, they, they knew, they, these were not dummies, these rabbis, they, they knew 40 years of something is, 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 is a problem. So they developed the belief, and it's traditional uh, belief, it's not Torah-based, it, but it's traditional, that the manna tasted any way in which you wanted it to taste. And I remember hearing this in third grade and thinking, wow, pastrami on rye anytime I want it. And then I envied the Hebrews in the desert. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very Jewish story. I would like, I like well, to point that out. Right wait, to the pastrami why is it a Jew? on rye. Oh, yeah, the pastrami God. on rye is Jewish. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. If you want to imagine BLT as a non Jew, you are totally. <laughs> Here's yeah. the other, okay, I the picked other the pastrami part, on yeah. The other part that's totally Jewish is that literally you have like food from the heavens and and you go immediately to the overwrite cantaloupe complaint with it. It's like, <laughs> it's it's literally food that has descended from <laughs> right, the heavens. Right, and right, you're right, like, that's right. 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 Yes, right. that's right. Exactly. I, 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 that's why it's a perfectly apt story. Like, can we get pretzel bread? <laughs> like, no, no, that's right. <laughs> All it's right, a, but it's important just to notice lad, one last little thing is that the manna gets taken into the to the ark and is put up in front of the Lord and not the quails, although both of were given to. Okay, so why 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 is that? Because it has to do important? with the it has to do with the the beginning or the seed or the the central point. Mm -hmm. It's and all potential. it's all related together, not potential. No? Like, okay, or, or, the, the seed is different from potential. The seed is like bound up actuality, you know, and then the body is. Outside, or the, the, the garments of skin are on the outside of the. Of the, the is, it, is there a difference between potential and bound up actuality? I think so. Okay. What is that? What? How so, so the seed. That? So the seed is like identity, all brought into in, in a place where you don't know what it is yet. It's an idea, mm -hmm. right? So you have an idea. And then you want to make it happen. So it, you look at what potential can give it body, and then you embody that idea into potential. But it's very different. So like a seed, so think about it like a, if you take a, a tree, a seed or acorn, and you plant it in different types of soil, then the potential of that soil will, uh, will make it grow to a certain extent. So it'll affect the manner in which this, the bound up seed will reveal itself. But that's the difference between- Do you think there's any potential that isn't a seed? at the same time because like what well one of the things you you mentioned before was that 
even if we're dealing with the transforming horizon of the world, there's of the future, there's some things that aren't going to come to be. We're not going to eat rocks or we certainly can't see how we're going to get there anyways. And so the potential is there and it's rich and it's infinite in some sense, but the potential still contains within it a structure. And, and that's also what we think when we deal with the transcendent objects. That's what scientists think is like, we don't know what this thing is that's outside of our realm of conception, but we know we have faith that it's going to have an intelligible structure. And so that means that to but me, it not to the extent that it's potential. Right. It, it, so things things are multiple. Like I mean, so how can I say this? So to the extent that something is potential, it is always potential for an actual. There's no other way to understand it. It's like it's like there's 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 an actuality, there's an identity, there's a quality, and then it has potential which is available to it, and then it will use that potential to reveal itself. But but there's so so like the things in the world are not just potential. They also have their own identities, and they also have their own. They have they have purposes, different types of purposes that we can identify, or different types of identities we can identify. But let's say, it's to the apple. extent that the extent that an apple is something that I can eat, then it's potential for me. Mm. Right. The seed is this. Is, is but you don't eat this. You don't like. Is the seed? But the, the the seed of I see the sense in which the seed is a, is a, is 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 a concrete actuality as the acorn is something in itself already. It's not just you know emptiness, but it is also the potential of becoming an oak. Right. Maybe it, it's that, the, that maybe it's the, the, the maybe it's the place of, where potential has initially transformed itself into actuality, I suppose, because the seed is the beginning But I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image, right? So it's like you, the, the seed obviously is not pure actuality. There is no pure actuality. It's, it's a, these are metaphysical categories. Uh, but but it's, it's the image that is always used to kind of help you understand what an, a completely invisible structure would be right so the invisible structure of the tree is is, is you, it's contained in the seed but really yeah. it is invisible like it's, well, an, god, it's, it's a god pattern. is seen as pure actuality in the sort of at least in the classical tradition thomas aquinas argues that, that and others argue that that god has to be pure actuality because something that is just potentiality can't just bring itself into being just because it's only potential being it's not actual being and so he sort of baptizes Aristotle's unmoved mover argument and then just says, right, there's got to be, got to go all the way back. And there has to be some ultimate bedrock, buck stopping, actualizing principle. And, and, and that's God. But John, so is the significance of the absence of the quail in the ark, is that just, because, is that an eschatological point? Is that the point that the, the endness of time has not, been, the, the, the fullness of time hasn't been consummate, consummated, we haven't reached the end of time? I, I think that, well, um, I think that it is it is related to the idea of the, the of the seed, but I think that for sure, as a Christian, I believe that that's what Christ brings. Like Christ brings the wine that is best at the end. Christ is the surprise of the end, the surprise of the stranger, the this kind of surprise. But I think in this case, we'll see. It, it's not. I think it's in Numbers where we see that the quails are actually another concession of God, like, because at first they get the mana, it doesn't say it in here, but at first they get the mana, then they keep complaining, and then they get the quails as a, like a further concession down the line. Yeah, the mana is the fundamental symbol of God's provision, and it's very interesting too relative to the fact that there's the, the promise of the promised land, the land flowing of milk and honey, that it says that the taste of the wafers was like honey, and so it's 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 this sense of the, the, it's a the provision of the, of the promise, land. yes, mm -hmm. a foretaste, yeah, of, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. And yeah, well, it, part of the reason that sugar is addictive is because it activates the system that guides you forward to the promised land. That's actually the case because the positive emotion that sucrose produces is a consequence of the activation, literally, of the system that is activated when you move towards a goal. So, so that's wait, so, what makes so it, do you see a positive role for sugar? Well, it's in its proportion, right? You I mean, do in its proportion. Well, because you, 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 I'm asking this from my own knowledge yeah. because uh, you, you have, and I, I, I buy it. It characterizes sugar as a sort well, of you a still, poison. Well, you still run on sugar. Like you, you still need sugar in your blood. It's, it's the fun. It's one of the fundamental. What, what do you call it? Fuels of survival. So, how much of that you should eat day to day? I don't know. I suspect it depends a lot on. One person, the person, right? You shouldn't eat it all the time because it makes you diabetic. That's a very bad idea. So, 
All right, so, and all the congregation of the children journeyed, now we're in, we're in 17, one. All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Mm. Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? That's what Abraham said to Sarah when, uh, was it Abraham to Sarah or, um, well, no, no, it was, a, uh, it was Jacob to Rachel when she complained about not him not giving her a child. He said, why are you complaining to me? It's God who decides. Mm -hmm. Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water and the people murmured against Moses. That's all that, that's that interesting phrase. They're all in the background. They're not really saying words. They're just grumbling, grumbling, mm -hmm. like your stomach voiceless grumbling. Yeah. yeah. And said, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord saying, what shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. So he has to get together with the elders and his staff. And the staff, in which it, it, it's really trying to help you connect, like the whole water issue. Because like mm -hmm. this, he did a lot of stuff with his staff, yeah, but like yeah. the staff in which you smote the river. Right, right. And, and, and go. Before, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, which is really what Moses did with Egypt, because Egypt's the stone, and Moses smite, smote? smote the stone with his rod and freed the Egyptians. And there, so this is a re recreation of the whole story in some real sense. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. But to get, that's so interesting because to get the water out of the rock, so the rock is, it's the kingdom of Egypt. It's the stone where nothing moves. It's the state. It's what's static. But for Moses to get the water out of the rock, he has to order he has to bring the elders of Israel along. So it's not, it's, it, the rock isn't tradition, right? Because you could easily identify the, the stone rock tyranny with tradition. That's the oppressive patriarchy. Well, I, I that is what happens here. But, but it's also, it's, is, it, is it Egypt? I don't know. I mean, Horeb is Sinai, right? So, so the yeah, rock is Horeb. It could be the mountain itself. Like there's something, well, I that's think it's Sinai, suggested. That's what he meant, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. right. So, so, so it looks like it's an anticipation of Sinai, so that the water is... It's divine water. It's God's yeah. continual sustenance. It's the water of mm -hmm. paradise. That right, 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 right. Definitely. But it's looking Definitely. ahead to the giving of, of the law on, on, on a rock. It's, all, it's also an encapsulation of mercy. Because one of the things I keep thinking with this, you said there's 10 times that they're complaining. And it's like, Pharaoh didn't do well when he complained. And when they're complaining, God keeps showing mercy. Mm -hmm. And part of what's happening is... In the is, desert in the desert and they're mo and part of that is because they're not enslaving others right but they're also learning the skills to contend with circumstances that can be tyrannical in a manner that is transformative without the same stakes and so if they if the staff can strike the stone and it yields water that's a skill for us, and you need the elders, that's right? That's right, what says that. Moses yeah. did so, so in the sight of the elders But of he tries, so he, Moses tries this time, because he goes, why are you talking to me, right? Talk, he's trying to get the faith down into them, right? But he needs the strength of all the elders to get water out of the stone, mm -hmm. right? To not have like the we same all outcome. Do. Like we all do, right? You need that, to build. That's another thing that, 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 that the dialogue between the conservatives and the liberals has to emphasize, is that for all of us to get water out of the stone, we need to do the actions that would allow that to happen in the sight of our elders. We cannot mm -hmm. just dispense with the tradition. Right. We're not free agents in and of ourselves. We're not autonomous souls only. It has to be integrated into the tradition for us to get the living water when, when we're in the desert and all we have is rocks. So. And by the way, later in Numbers, yeah. that's of course with the rock when God tells Moses he can't get into Israel when uh, Moses uh, hits the rock. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, 
it's completely understandable that in a virtually identical situation, he would hit the rock, given that he was told to hit the rock the first time here in Exodus. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I, what's I, the difference when he hits Here's the difference. Thank you for asking. That's the key. The sin was not hitting the rock. The sin was that he said, you rebels, watch how Aaron and I bring forth right. water. Oh, great, Dennis. Great, great, right. Well, and, and, and did, did, does he do it in the sight of the elders in Numbers? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Okay, he well, takes, we'll have to remember takes, that when we get yes, there. Yes, but he takes credit. He takes credit. That's the key. Right. That's not the hitting, because God looks like yeah. a jerk, and I hate when God looks like a jerk. <laughs> If all, all of this of because you happens. hit it, uh, you hit it, but didn't speak to it, then you can't get into Israel. Mm -hmm. It makes God. I can't. I don't like that. Right. God, God's pretty don't, damn good. Don't don't confuse yourself with the power that brings water out of rocks. Right, I did it. Yes, you said to the Israelites that you and Aaron are doing it. It's that that's the killer. Okay. And God said it. You didn't sanctify my name in front of the Israelites. Yeah. Doing that, that well, continue it, continue out of tyranny is slowly. As as slowly as you can move forward appropriately, that's the rule. Okay. You can't make a mistake. You can't take credit, right? It's, but it's a merciful rule here because every time, like you know, as we said, when the Pharaoh hardens his heart, horrible things happen. But the Jews are allowed a lot of leeway here. The Israelites. But also, mistaking yourself for that precisely means that you can you can therefore not enter the promised land. See, the Jews are also yes. the Jews aren't exactly no. hardening their hearts here. They're suffering. Right, and so in suffer one of the things about suffering and complaining about suffering, <laughs> it's a weird thing because what a real what a real tyrant does is he denies you the validity even of your own suffering. So in the Soviet Union, if you complained about the fact that there wasn't bread, then you were an enemy of the state, and that's tyranny, man. You don't even get to be hungry in a in a tyranny. And so at least the Israelites, they're not so tyranny, they're not so tyrannical that they deny their own hunger. And so maybe that's why God, maybe that's why God isn't treating them. It's because it isn't that the Pharaoh and the Egyptians were faithless, it's that they were stubborn. At least when you're suffering and you complain, you at least give voice to the suffering. That's something. It's at least indication of the absence of a total tyranny. Your ability to doubt, which is the ability to be free. Well, your ability to just recognize at least to recognize in yourself that something is crying out that needs to be taken care of. Now, you might say to someone like that, well, adopt some responsibility and take care of it, but at least the, at least the suffering is, it's being given a voice. And so maybe that's why God's more merciful to that. It seems reasonable to me that that might be the case. And be sure, oh, let's go here, 17.7. Uh, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. So that's another tribe. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So what do you make of, what do you make of that, Jonathan? So Moses, as long as his hands are up towards God, the Israelites are winning. Then when, when Moses gets tired, and lets his hands down, then the Israelites lose, and then people come and help him. <clears throat> so yeah. what's what's going on there with the hands up? Is that that's it's, I mean, it, 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 it's the same as so many of the other places we've seen. It, it has to do with proper Except orientation, like this, and and it's, it's, he's properly he he has his hands up towards the heavens, towards right. God. But obviously, he needs the two pillars in order to be able to do that. And Aaron and her, 
they end up being the two pillars which help you orient yourself properly. It's the same image as and the so, two pillars. And, and even so, even though Moses is a prophet of God and a primary prophet of God, he needs help. Yeah. Right. So there's this there's real responsibility elsewhere than in the direct profit and, and you necessary. Could have, though you could really understand it that, let's say, you have a conflict, you have any problem, if you keep your eyes oriented towards the goal and you anchor that properly in, mm -hmm. in, in two legs that are, like two sides that are able to, to make it go, then you will win. Like, but if you lose that focus, then you lose. You can't, if you're not, if you don't have the pro proper orientation in anything that you do, then, well, it's then what are you going to do? Orientation like and gonna, support. That's right. It's orientation and support. Yeah. Well, and that echoes the idea that Moses needs the elders there too to get the water out of the stone. And so that's partly the, that's partly the psychological orientation, right? Which the liberal types, I would say, and, and the Protestants would place more stress on, but then it's also the, the support and the tradition that are preconditions for that to actually occur. So it's also just a very beautifully humane image. I mean, Moses can't hold up his hands on his own. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I think it's such a, a deep image of, of how we need each other. Right, and, right, you know, How we need the, the support, which Charles even Williams called the coherence. Even with the, our goodwill. The, the, yes, it, it's not that he doesn't know where his hand should be. He can't, mm -hmm. he actually can't do it. Right. Like he cannot do it without the help of Especially those. when there's a war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, and it's also, it's, it's an image of what's coming later, which is that Moses will have to settle, a, create a hierarchy of authority, which flows from him into the, the, the mm. people, or else he can't do it on his own. Like, just, just, just him and everybody else, like, it, it doesn't work. There needs to be this layout. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Is there relevance to the fact that it's Joshua here? Do you know the well, name Joshua? Yeah, you I mean he is the, the, the savior and he's also yes. going to replace, he's the one who's getting into the promised land. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, he is and the one. So this is the Joshua that gets into the promised land. That's right, land. it's the same Joshua. Starting to see right. the so, beginning of the, the transition of right. political power and authority. And another entreaty ritualize this. Mm -hmm. And so why do you suppose, why does Joshua, why does Joshua appear here then? Why in, why in this part of the story? Because this is really the first time he appears, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. So, so Joshua is the man who ch the man who chooses out men and goes out and fights. That he then, is like he is like, like so. He, so uh, M Moses is the attention, and then Joshua is the action. Like Joshua is the one who's embodying Moses's attention into the into the battlefield. So he's like, I mean, think about it. Like he's the. He's the, the, the he's Moses' assistant. Yeah. Right, who, but he's the one that gets into the promise. He will, he will, yes, he will well, replace he's also him. one of the two spies that gave a favorable report. Yeah, that's the reason why he will get in. Yeah, get in. Right. But he it's the, it's also to show that he is Okay, now Joshua is a type of Christ, if I remember yeah. correctly. Okay. Well, for obviously for a Christian, just for, just yes, for yes, knowledge, yes. I'm not denying yeah. that it's not an issue yeah. for me. The the um just so you'll know, it, it may, may or may not be. His name is Yehoshua, whereas Jesus is Yeshua. So it's not the same name as Joshua. Mm -hmm. Just, just right, right. What does Joshua. it mean? It means Yehoshua. the same thing. Oh, it does mean the yes, same thing. Yes, okay. it's to to save, uh, basically to save. Uh, but but it, but it's, Joshua it's is not so the, is Joshua, is Joshua is Yehoshua. acting out the will of the prophet. Okay. Okay. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, for he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Also, just very quickly, I don't know what, what to make of this, but in verse 8 there, the, the, the battle that Joshua fights, it, it begins, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And so unlike, you know, the grumblings and the, the thirst, which of course is very interesting because it's this reduction to your most basic human need, unlike those things that you might say are the Israelites' own internal problems, their grumbling, their faithlessness, etc., this is a, an, an external force coming to attack them, and Joshua is the principle that repels, repels them. So it's a different category of opposition in the wilderness. It's maybe not so much so what, with, what, with... What do you think that in, indicates about Joshua's role or place or spirit that's specific 
Right, because you're right, he comes up when there's an external threat in the desert. So he's that force which allies itself against an obvious external enemy. He's also going to be the one who leads them into the the land. And so there's, I don't know what to say other than that there's clearly a kind of, uh, he is the representative able to realize the Israelites' journey towards where they are are going in, and let's call it in a, Practical in this in a practical sense in the face of actual opposition. So it's it's less. I think that what I'm just trying to get at there's a sense between in the sense Moses is you know bringing the revelation or speaking the revelation from God, and there is a profound sense in which Joshua is enacting it. Enacting it. Okay. So it's about embodiment. So you have here an embodiment in battle, and then you have an embodiment in claiming the land. Yeah. The claiming the land and fighting off the enemies and embodying it in so action. So it's actuality. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a... Okay, okay. It had been prophesied, it had been foretold, and then I guess that's the seed, and then it's now beginning to take to yeah. take form. And worth and saying, action. too, an external enemy diminishes the resentful murmuring and grumbling. Mm-hmm. And it, just in a bigger narrative case, like I've mentioned this before, but it's important to understand that in terms of large, large biblical narrative, these people that are being fought, they are the external threat. That is, they are the, the children of the curse, right? They are all the children of the Hamites, this idea of, of, of people that are coming out, that are manifesting the abominations, let's say. And so it's hard for us to think that way because... But it's important to understand because when we see the Israelites clearing out these people in the land, there's a sense in which the reason why they're being cleared out is because they are abominable in different ways. And it's not always described why, but that's why they're described as giants. They're described as, as people who practice things that are completely abhorrent. And, and, and so there's this clearing out of abhorrent practice in order to establish a proper land for the proper identity, for the proper orientation to manifest itself. Yeah. yeah, and it's not just, you don't, like, relative that we talk about the phone and the distractions and the inner life and all the inner obstacles we give ourselves, that's a big part of life, but it's, that's not all there is, right? It's not just the inner demons the demons you have to overcome. Right. It's, you know, the actual difficulty of, you know, the things in front of you in the world. It's not just all, it's not simply an existential internal journey. Right. The internal, internal journey also has to, has to work itself out positively right. in the world. Right, right. Well, and there's enmity inside, and maybe that's the paramount enmity in some sense, if it's a spiritual battle, but that doesn't mean there isn't an enmity outside too. So and with the Red Sea, the Lord did it all. Here they have to do it. And there's a partnership. Joshua has to fight as if Moses is not praying. And Moses prays for all he's worth as if Joshua is not fighting. And those are very important points. So that's slave. part of them taking on the, partnership, the, and, and the well, and also the the responsibilities of actually being a state. Absolutely. Yeah, because of the contemplative and the and the activist. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's it's worth noting that it's important that that it says the Amalekites are, are, are sort of are, are launching the uh, are beginning the hostilities that that which, mm-hmm. as Jonathan says, will be you know it's, it's kind of this perennial thorn in the side of of, of the Israelites. But this becomes a key passage in a debate between Augustine, and I can't remember, I think it's Faustus, and Augustine's response to Faustus saying, this is all that the topic of holy war, can can a religiously motivated war ever be justified? And Augustine's response to Faustus is, is that yes, yes it can. Um, the war itself is not intrinsically evil, provided certain criteria are, are met. Uh, one is that it's got to be for a, a just cause, to relieve innocent suffering normally. It's got to be proportionate. There's got to be realistic prospects of success and so on and so forth. And this actually is one of the few kind of theological ways of thinking that is that is still with us today in, in, in a completely secularized form and is still there's established. Still, there's still proper conduct, yeah, conduct a, of the battlefield. Absolutely. And it's really what it's the sort of principle, the principles that animate the Geneva Convention and sort of the laws of war to this day. But it, I just remembered, now it, it starts from exactly this biblical example. This is the, 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 the bone of contention between Faustus and Augustine. And so it's really the kernel of a modern thinking of, of just war right. theory. Well, mm. so, okay, so we have the idea here that the war is represented as just because as long as Moses has his hands up to heaven and is in the proper place, then the war 
is justifiable, but yes. it also proceeds well. That's one of the criteria. So, it's got to be rightly intended. The intention has to be right. Mm -hmm. the, the, cause, vision. the cause has to be right. Here, the fact that they were provoked is probably, uh, is probably justification enough that they respond proportionately. And, and so there are a number of other criteria as well. But I think it's just striking that, you know, we're talking, you know, we might ask again, or well, why is it that we're sitting around reading this, this ancient text? Yes, it's very, very significant for some of us, but, but it contains within it the seeds mm -hmm. of, yeah. of profound moral insight into the human condition and also into really difficult applied ethical right. situations. Well, it's almost impossible which, to overestimate the degree to which so many things that we take for granted have their seed in this. I mean, yeah. just as simple, I was assembling a, a course on the Sermon on the Mount earlier this week, and every verse in the Sermon on the Mount has many great works of art associated with it, not just one, many, many, many. And so it's just, it's just a plethora of phenomena that sprang forth out of all of these verses. And it's, it, it, I guess one of the things that you do when you're being educated about such matters is you go back and you think, oh my God, there's this entire tree that's grown out of this tiny seed, and this is where it started. I mean, even the countings that you get in here, you think, well, you have these strange parts of the text where, well, in numbers, it's all, it's all counting. You think that's so boring. It's like, yeah, fair enough, man, but that's the beginning of, literally, that's the beginning of statistics. Mm. Well, we saw earlier, the tw was it 12 and, and 70, you know, already we're starting to see the symbolism of number and its power. Yeah, well, yeah. And that's, the, that's the mathematical, think of that's part of the math, the mathematical analysis of the state. That's a non-trivial technological revolution and it's got to start in its nascent form. And it looks strange when you see it now, you think, why, that, why is that in there? It's like, well, why do we have statistics? Which are, statistics literally means the, the mathematics of the state. I was going so, to react to your comment about the great works of art in the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm gonna tie it into your Israel and Egypt comment and I'll show you how. Uh, so I am convinced, uh, not because I'm a believer, I'm just convinced on rational grounds that secular society does not produce great art. Uh, that uh, and uh, 20th century, 21st century music and art and architecture and in, in there uh, as represented in music by atonality, which is an oxymoron, atonal music is not music. Music needs a, a tonal base. It, it, it needs needs melody. It needs harmony to, to be, or certainly melody, or to be music as we understand it. All of that was rejected. Beauty was rejected in the in the graphic arts. So I'm tying it into your comment because who was the conductor you mentioned again? John Elliott Gardner. Yeah, John. I I, I interviewed John Elliott Gardner when he wrote his book on Bach. And I asked him, I don't, I didn't know if he's religious or secular. I assume these secular most musicians are. And I said, I'm just curious. And it's, 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 it's on tape. Uh, do you think that great art is possible uh, without uh, uh, having a, in any way a religious society or, an, or a God orientation? He said, I don't think it's possible. I was stunned. I mean, I, I, that's exactly what I believe. Well, at some, at some level, I, I, I learned this to some degree as a clinician when I was talking to people about very, very serious things. There is no distinction in some fundamental way between serious, great, and religious. I mean, those things that call out of us a religious response are serious and great things. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the ways that you can discover the religious in the secular world. It's like, well, once you understand that that's definitional in some sense, well, okay, you're, you're an atheist. Well, are there great and lesser things? Well, if there weren't, how could you orient your attention? Because you're gonna orient your attention towards the most important things. Okay, is there a rank order of importance? Well, clearly there is, because otherwise it's a chaotic mess. All right, then the deepest things or the highest things in the rank order of importance, they're the most profound. Well, those are the most profound things. Well, those are the religious things. It's a matter of definition. And then it's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of experience. Are there things that move you deeply? Yes. How about beauty? Well, yes, that's one of them. Is that religious? That's not a matter of argument. That's a matter of definition. Those are the religious things. They're either the foundation or the pinnacle, depending on how you look at it. But I don't see that as a matter of, it's not a matter of categorical discussion. It's a matter of observation about the structure of reality. 
And I, I just can't, and I think all the discussions we've had with Verveke on the cognitive science front seem to point in exactly the same direction. You have to have a hierarchy of attention. It has to be structured. It's either got a pinnacle or a foundation, depending on how you use the metaphor. And the deepest things are religious. And I, I think I stumbled across this in part because every time I talk to my clinical clients about the deepest possible matters, the conversation immediately took on the language of religion. Because we couldn't talk about this. You couldn't talk about it. If it. You couldn't talk about it, the deepest, terrible things that happen to people without talking about good and evil. There's no way to talk about them. And there's certainly no way to deal with them. And if you're dealing with evil in the most fundamental sense, then the only redemptive path out of that is good. And, and if it's that evil's deep enough, and believe me, if you pay attention as a clinician, especially in families that are unbelievably fractured for generations, if you think, if you aren't seeing what's there as somehow fundamentally and foundationally malevolent, you just mm. haven't so, got to so, the bottom so, of things. So wait a minute, Jordan, I just want to make sure I've understood you. So you think that in your clinical practice, when you were coming to confront true evil, in your view, true and true goodness, mm -hmm. that became it was only religious language, the only way that well, you could talk about how could that it, was it, yes, in religious because, terms. Well, what's the antidote to the greatest evil? Well, it got to be the greatest good. And so, and trauma, like one of the things you certainly learn if you study trauma, and I would say, say this sec, in a secular way, is that trauma occurs when people are torn apart at the depths of their being. Okay, what does that? Tragedy? No. Tragedy is not so good. Malevolence does it. So that's betrayal, for example. You know, it's like, it's not just that you were mm -hmm. hurt. It was that mm -hmm. you were betrayed by someone in whom you'd put all your faith and your love. And that, that will tear you to pieces. And that, in your view, is a real force that couldn't be reduced and given some kind of physiological you, sure. evolutionary you, account. You could, give, you could give it a physiological and an evolutionary ah, okay, account, so but it's... you won't reduce it. You will right. not reduce it. Okay. In fact, if, if all you do is say... Well, it's theological, but it's also physiological and biological. Mm -hmm. And so it, all those it's things come those together. It's got those lower instantiations, those Absolutely. expressions. I right. think you can, make, you can make an almost completely materialist account in some sense of what happens to the structure of conception as a consequence of trauma. Say, imagine that you, you, your conceptions are hierarchical, so some conceptions are based on others. Well, the more conceptions that a given conception supports, the more fundamental that conception is, until you get all the way to the conception that's at the bottom. If you have that conception torn out from you, all the conceptions fall, and then chaos reigns, and that will kill you virtually, and if it doesn't, you'll bloody well wish you were dead. Right, so it sounds to me like you've got the makings of an argument for the existence of God from the problem of evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that. Well, that's also why I think I also think to some degree that that's why we've been gazing on the figure of the crucifixion for two thousand years. It's like, well, that's the core of. It's not just malevolence because it's also tragedy, but it's, it's it's certainly the crux of the two. Say, so what do you see if you look hard enough at that? Well, do you do you see tragedy and malevolence? Well, the answer to that first is absolutely, but maybe the answer to it is if you gaze upon it long enough. It's like the snake in the wilderness, is you gaze upon the poison long enough and you become immune to the poison. Or Dostoevsky, remember I told you when we first met, he looked at the picture of Christ on the cross for two hours and at the end of it remarked famously, I do not know the answer to the problem of evil, but I do know love. Mm -hmm. That was a huge turning point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if, mm -hmm. if Douglas was here, he was telling, we were talking about John Rutter who writes in, composes incredible sacred music and is not known to be a believer. Mm -hmm. And Douglas knows him. Maybe you do, James. Douglas was talking to him, and, he's, and Rutter said to him, when I compose, yeah, I'm a believer. I am a Christian. Uh, look, I had, I had clients well, like that all the time who were, well, who were, well, who were, extraordinary. Who were sublimely <laughs> creative. But as soon as they thought or spoke, they were in trouble. And because their rational mind which was where their belief was in some sense, would just fragment them. They were nihilistic. They'd even tear apart their own artistic product. Why am I doing this? What's the use of this? Why, it, we're all going to die. The, the, the nihilism would surround the creativity. But one of the things that I learned to do with my creative clients was just like, just be there more. 
Be in the creative domain more. That's actually where all your health, and they knew this, this is where all your health was. They would tell me that. I only feel good when I'm creating. It's like, okay then. Mm -hmm. This rational rattle trap murmuring that's in your mind that you think that's your belief. It's for, for a lot of those people, that was like, that was just Luciferian nihilism and presumption. Mm -hmm. And they would say, well, that's what I believe. It's no, that's what you say when you're doubting your belief. And, 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 and this was particularly true for creative people, but other people find it in other places, like the open people find it in creativity, but the nihilistic agreeable types, they find that in interpersonal love. So, and the conscientious people find it in duty. So, all right, well, I think we should probably stop. So we're at the end of 17, just at the beginning of 18. That's good, this seems like a good place to close off. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for participating in this seminar uh, part seven. All of you watching and listening, uh, we appreciate your time and attention and effort and all of that. And to the Daily Wire Plus crew who, and the people behind the scenes who are making this possible both practically and financially, um, uh, note of appreciation as well. And then gentlemen, on to uh, the eighth part, which will be the last of the first half of this seminar. And uh, so I would like uh, particularly today to thank Greg Hurwitz, who has been with us here for, you were here the second day until the seventh day, and that wasn't enough, but it was a lot better than none. And we definitely hope that you'll be here for the next half because we found your participation extremely useful. And uh, so we'd like to thank you for contributing to this and hope you'll come back. Thank you, I was, it was an honor. And Jordan, my, my heart jumped when you invited me for Exodus. Because, you know, Matthew Arnold's idea, the West is this conversation between what he called the Hebrew and the Hellene. Mm -hmm. right. And there's no question in your field and many others, the Greeks have had the bigger say. And I think it's time to restore the balance. Because when it comes to freedom, the biblical, the Hebrew, is infinitely richer. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh. <laughs> so what have you been up to, Moses? It's like, well, you know, there was a plague, sequence of plagues, and there's des this whole Red Sea thing. <laughs> How about you, Jethro? <laughs> <laughs>